and with students from around our state, it makes an incalculable difference. You reach thousands of students that we ourselves um, may never be able to fully reach in the way that you can. You give them hands-on experiences. You give them a chance to be outdoors. You give them specialized learning in areas that we are not able to give them here at the Texas Education Agency. You inspire them. You give teachers opportunities to get CPE, continuing professional education credit. For all of that, you are valued partners for the Texas Education Agency. And we will have a certificate of cooperation for each of you um, to, um, for this upcoming year for your participation today. So we thank you very much for being here. I wanna share my screen and just briefly go through the agenda. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, so um, we're gonna start with an overview of what's happening with the science teaks, which is everything. Everything is changing with them. And I wanna share that with you. I wanna share with you what's been already um, completed, the work that's completed, the work that has um, just now underway and the work that is um, just about to begin. In fact, beginning today. Um, <clears throat> and, and let you know how you can be involved. Um, after that, we have a writing round table. Um, I think some of you may know if you have um, your own children in school or you work with young children that writing is taking on an added importance now in our state. Um, although it was always taught as part of reading language arts, it will now be part of the, the STAR assessment in every grade um, up through middle school for the reading language arts. And so it won't just be um, teachers and students at grades four and seven most interested in this, but it will be something that will be taught and, and newly, newly emphasized at schools around our state. And then um, we just got an email from Barney Fudge. He has been called away to do a bill analysis. We have to do analyses of bills before the legislature. They have to be turned around within 24 hours. Barney, in our department, more than anybody has more bills. He has all of physical education and as well as all of PE. However, I want you to know, I, um, Kiki and I were at a meeting with Barney on, online. I took some notes at that meeting. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things that Barney shared with us. So it's briefer than it would have been um, and, and a small change in schedule, but we will, we will discuss it briefly and give you a link to where to see these teaks as soon as they are posted. And you see, then we start with our wonderful spotlights. Um, um, this one, the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. And then we have Texas Home Learning. This is a new resource to assist educators and you can use it as well. Um, we, we might move our, our Bureau of Economic Geology spotlight up um, to before the break, we'll see how that goes. But we're so happy to have that as well. And then we have Houston Audubon Society. And then um, Viviana Lopez will join us. You know how important it is that each of you give continuing professional education credit. And 
if you're educators, get it. It's important to your license and you have to keep up as providers with um, the latest on this. And so Viviana will be discussing that with you. And then we're going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to return. We're going to talk about these new science and engineering practices, a big shift um, in our science teaks and get a little experience with that. After that break, we're going to go into the Brit education. Um, we're, we're really pleased. Um, almost all of these spotlight providers joined us at CAST, the Conference for the Advancement of Science Teaching this year. And um, this was um, a terrific way to share with science educators what TIAC providers are doing. So we've asked them back to reprise um, their presentations, sharing what they're doing and how they're reaching out to, to people um, during this pandemic. So it's a, I think you'll find these very valuable. Um, then, on, um, then we'll be doing STEM education. A lot of you um, work primarily, I know, with elementary and middle school, but STEM education is really an important initiative, comes out of career and technical education. We're really pleased to have our, our, um, our, our STEM coordinator, Michelle Sedbury, join us for that presentation. Um, so this may open some new, um, new avenues for, for how you work with schools. And then Coastal Bend's, um, Bend's and estuaries, that should be plural, pardon me, um, will join us. And um, um, our vet med teacher resources from Texas A&M. So we have a jam packed um, schedule and um, we're really pleased about this. I wanna especially um, give a call out and a special thank you to two people. Um, Kiki Corey is the TIAC chair. Kiki, say, say, say something so you're on camera for a minute, then we'll come back to you. Hi, y'all. So good to see you guys. Mm -hmm. And Linda McCall from the Bureau of Economic Geology, she and her team um, with tech support from David Chang are here hosting this meeting. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda, um, who is going to um, welcome you on behalf of the BEG and get us going with today's activities. Linda? Good morning. How's everybody doing today? <clears throat> yeah. I've thought about this and realized I'm not only a boomer, I'm a Zoomer, given this new environment we're in. <laughs> <laughs> We were so happy last year to host this group at our facilities. Uh, and given what happened, I think it's so much resilience has been shown across the state in education. And uh, we're very happy to host again on Zoom. Um, so thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we'll be helping behind the scenes and a little later, <laughs> Uh, just to help us get to know each other, we're going to be using breakout rooms uh, to put you into and bring you back. We'll put you in breakout rooms for three minutes and then bring you back and then remix the group, put you into breakout rooms and back again uh, so that we get to know each other because that was a big part of the benefit. I always enjoyed getting to know you and uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. So folks, um, and Linda, perhaps you can answer this. <clears throat> I stopped screen sharing, but then automatically I am getting you are screen sharing. Every time I stop, it just pops back. So it, you are seeing my agenda now, are you not? Yes, 
All right, I am going to stop sharing. My hand is off the mouse. And it's just going back to, to sharing. It's not now. It's not good. Okay. Okay. Keep your hands up <laughs> off the mouse. <laughs> good grief. All right. So um, I am so happy to see you guys. We are four pages of, of little screens in gallery view. Um, and this is truly my favorite favorite thing of the to start the year is to is to be in the same room with you and it being in the same Zoom room is um, a little bit odd. We are actually um, probably at our largest capacity that we've ever had. So the Zoom room actually sort of stretches bigger than than the room with the walls. Uh, some of you guys who have been to many many uh, years of meetings. Um, you remember how sometimes we'll get really squished because so many want to come. So I'm so glad to see you guys. Um, because we have such a large group, uh, we're going to try to, you know, keep keep on mute and, unless you're like asked to, to contribute and to talk and use the chat as I see lots and lots of people are. Um, that will also be recorded. So like nothing's private. But but if you do need to want to have a side uh, conversation. Remember to watch whether you're like responding privately to somebody or to everyone. Yeah, I've done that. Anyway, um, and oh, the other thing is you can share links to your resources and and websites and and online thingies with each other. You might want to like put what it is and then the link, and then that way you guys can copy that off of the chats because. I don't know that we'll be able to publish all of those like afterwards, but this is one way that we could share. So that's the the table out in the hall that's covered with brochures. That's that <clears throat> function, right? <laughs> so um, that uh, I think that that's probably the nuts and bolts of it. So we probably want to. Oh, we ha I don't know that I introduced myself except for that Irene said that I'm the TAC chair. So I'm with Texas Parks and Wildlife for you guys who I don't know. Um, and I'm the project wild coordinator. And so between Irene and I, we, um, we, we, we play TAC together, the two agencies, Texas Parks and Wildlife and TEA. Um, and, uh, and it has been my pleasure to be the chair for more than a decade, and I'm, I refuse to count any more than that. <laughs> Kiki, I think it must be 13 years. Yeah, at least. At, le at least. At yeah. least. It's, it's, it's been a pretty it's good been, while. It's been a joy for me. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is Linda is going to, because she's the host, uh, going to create random breakout rooms of just a few people. And so you will jump into that breakout room, talk to that to the other people in the room with you to see who else is in the room. For you guys who, um, what we normally do is we pass the microphone around so that everybody can see who everybody is. But obviously that's not gonna work with 96 participants on a Zoom call. That would take all day and we would all die um, of Zoomness. So we're not going to do it that way. What this this is the the um, online substitution. So you're going to go into the breakout room. You'll have three minutes to visit with the people in that room. Then we'll come back. Then she'll set another breakout room, and hopefully, if this works like we want it to, it will scramble you into different groups, and then you can talk with that. And we'll do that um, a few times, maybe two, maybe three. Now that we don't have Barney, we've got a little bit more time. Maybe three. Okay. So, uh, Linda, you ready? Yes, and uh, the, everybody knows you have the ability to unmute yourself. So when you go and you can talk, that little microphone. Uh, okay, have fun. Oh, yeah, you're also going to want to show your face. That makes a difference in the breakout rooms. Okay, go. Here we go. So did everybody have a chance to meet at least one or two other people who were at the meeting? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, fantastic. Um, we're going to start with our agenda um, now on the science teaks review. So I am going to um, share my screen and I have slides and I, um, and I want you to be able to see all these slides. So, okay. So here we are, <clears throat> a giant, um, a giant picture of students doing some, and 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 educators and others doing some wonderful um, aquatic field investigations. So we are going to be talking about three things during this meeting. Um, the first is the the science cheeks review, which is the most critical thing. Um, we have not really had a full rev review and revision of the science teak since 2010. And then we're going to go through some ways my supervisor, Luis Salinas, the director of science, has put together some slides to give some feedback in, into how you can give feedback if you want to give feedback into this process. And I think they're very valuable. So we're going to um, spend some time with that. And then we're on to the scientific and engineering practices. Um, and I will call them the SEPs at time because we start to use acronyms very quickly in my agency. So let's begin. First, the TEKS review process. And the reason I want you to know this is this applies to not only the science TEKS, but every other subject you might be interested in and, and gives you a sense of how you can participate in this. So the State Board of Education, this is the law right here with the direct participation of educators, parents, business and industry representatives and employers. So you see, you are part of this. Ad, um, adopts revisions to the TEKS. Um, the TEKS review and revision process takes between one and two years from start to finish. Um, the TEKS were initially um, ad adopted in 1998. And I was lucky enough to be a TEA just as that was starting. And it was an exciting thing because TEKS were developed for every subject and every grade. We had committees in every hotel in Austin um, working on this and all around the state as well. Um, in 2017, the science TEKS were streamlined to reduce the content required to be mastered by students during an instructional year. So um, this is a process, if, if you at all um, are on any of the TEA lists for a subject area, you, you can find out how to apply for these committees. And um, they, they are going on now pretty much all the time. Um, we, as I said, we're just starting some today. Um, so the, the initial step is that the Texas Education Agency, the State Board of Education and the Regional Education Service Centers complete some initial steps. Then there are content advisors that provide feedback and the, the board has to make certain approvals. And then the work groups begin. So I had that highlighted. That is ongoing for some science um, TEKS um, as we speak. Then there's feedback from the content advisors. And the other thing I have highlighted is a discussion by the State Board of Education. And at this meeting at the end of January, there will be discussion on some of the science TEKS. Of course, you can attend all these Zoom meetings and and, and um, um, you can give input. 
And then finally, um, there is rulemaking that takes place. So let's go into the science TEKS review. Here's the timeline, and this is pretty important. Um, so during this school year, there'll be revised science TEKS across the board. And that means um, not only high school courses that count for science credit, but all the middle school TEKS, all the elementary TEKS, all the career and technical education courses that count for science credit toward graduation um, are expected to be um, revised by the end of this uh, school year, this calendar year. Um, and then we'll have a, 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 um, instructional materials reviewed and adopted in 22-23. You can be on committees to review instructional materials to see if um, they meet the TEKS. Uh, I am happy to send you invitations to these things. But here's the other date I want you to see, 23-24. I know a lot of you like to correlate your materials to certain of our TEKS. And so 23-24 is when schools will be required to begin using these new revised science TEKS. So your work for correlation should take, uh, would hopefully would be completed by this time. So that gives you a few years after they're adopted to maybe assemble some committees and, and get that work done if you want to do that. Um, and you'll see there are some parts that you probably will want to incorporate in your materials. And at that time, um, our um, state test for um, academic achievement, um, our STAR test will be assessing the bridge standards. That is the, the TEKS that were there um, previously in the current set of TEKS um, and, uh, and the new ones that overlap. And then finally in 24, 25, only the new standards will be assessed. So where are we in the process? Um, and just to let you know, four courses have had their TEKS adopted by the State Board of Education. So it is done for them. Biology, chemistry, IPC, which is integrated physics and chemistry and physics. But very notably, new science and engineering practices K through 12 have also been adopted. So we're going to hear about these maybe a little bit in this part of the presentation. And then later on, we're going to dive into them more thoroughly. So you can look at these new cheeks um, under the, um, well, you will be able to look at them. They're not posted yet. They have to go to the Texas Register, but um, they will be posted under a, adopted um, rules not yet effective. And I'll show you in a, a later where on our website. So right now, middle school review is just wrapping up the sixth, seventh and eighth grade review. By the way, one key thing I want you all to know, and this is critical, the content advisors advised, TEKS review, the groups have so far have followed this, that to retain that 40% lab and field um, and classroom investigation that was in the, um, in the TEKS previously. So that has been retained. Um, elementary is just starting. They're the ones starting today. Um, so we don't know what, what their recommendations will be, but it is part of what students need to know and be able to do um, at high school and at middle school as well. Now these middle school drafts are scheduled to go before the State Board of Education for discussion this spring. 
So we're thinking this will happen at the April board meeting. Um, and this is, a, this is very exciting. A lot of you work with the middle school um, grades. Now, right now, um, and I will be at, uh, I will be helping facilitate one of these groups tomorrow, um, are these remaining high school courses, um, environmental systems, aquatic science, astronomy, earth and space science, and the new independent study course are all um, being worked on as we speak by work groups. Um, they're meeting virtually. Um, the, the independent study course is very exciting. It's a course that can be used for high school credit, or that's the plan for it, of course. Um, and um, it, it will allow the study of, of topics that are um, not topics that we often study. Um, and, and we already have one course called Scientific Research and Design that can do that. That's a CTE course that counts for science credit. And this is a science course. Um, and for, for example, topics like um, a, um, marine science, a specialized for, you know, specialized aquatic science um, set of topics or botany or topics that normally are not covered that students are interested in. So you do some work, I think, in helping students have interest in these areas. Um, some specialized geology courses, for example, um, might, be, might be something that students might want to work on. Um, right now, work is beginning this spring. That is, it's beginning today uh, for grades kindergarten through grade five. And, um, and hopefully this will this work may also finish up this spring and then we'll go to the State Board of Education for discussion. These have not started yet. Look at all these career and technical education courses that count for science credit. I think some of you will look at this long list of courses and, and see that perhaps these might be things that you, in your, in your area, have um, specific knowledge of, and you might actually apply to be on these work groups to um, rewrite these courses. Uh, I'm going to show you that link in a minute. Um, so here are the, the uh, the TEA committee educator application. When you go on and click on this link and I'll make sure you get these slides so you can do that. Um, it will say, um, the first thing it wants to know is what district you're from. All you do is at the very top of that long list of districts starting with maybe a leaf, ISD, et cetera, you pick other at the very top of that list. And um, just go ahead and complete your application. Um, there, have to, there, there are typically representatives from around the state who are chosen. The state board members uh, do that choosing primarily. So it, there, I'm, it's not a guarantee that you would, anybody would get in, but there's a, a, a good possibility. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I told you the second big hunk of what we were going to be doing is opportunities for feedback. And there are several ways this can happen. The survey has already gone out and taken place, so that's finished. But after each work group um, meets, they're, they're um, drafts are posted up on the TEA website. There are also public hearings where people can sign up to speak and it often makes quite a bit of a difference. Um, there's also a public hearing during the meeting <clears throat> at second reading, which is the, where the final adoption takes place and written public comments can be submitted. 
often what I see is very effective is people learn who their state board of education member is or other state board members and <clears throat> send their feedback straight to the board members, which you can do as well. <clears throat> so you can, um, you can submit public feedback on work group drafts at teeks at tea.texas.gov. Um, also, hopefully you're signed up for our newsletters, which are called our listservs, which are called our bulletins, um, our, our way of, of sending out notices to, to uh, folks in the field. You can do online testimony. Um, you have to sign up by 8 a.m. on Friday um, before the board meeting, and that remains open through five o'clock on the Monday before the board meeting. Typically, you only get about three minutes at most. Sometimes it goes down to two. Um, if approved at, for first reading and filing authorization, the proposal is filed with the Texas Register and posted on the TEA website. And then there's an official public comment uh, period. Um, people can submit written comments then. So here are the best practices. And I think this is really, um, really important um, for you to know about. Good feedback is timely. And that typically means it's early in the process. The sooner you get your feedback in, the better. It's organized and succinct, and it's specific and actionable. So I, we have some examples that Luis has compiled. Let me just show you these, if you ever think about submitting feedback. And I know in the past, organizations like TAEE, um, the Texas Association for Environmental Education sub has submitted feedback. So organizations submit feedback. Um, groups can submit feedback. Um, we have our current Earth and Space Science course because um, Earth, um, a group of essentially Earth science educators got together and brought their ideas to the board. So people in the field can make things happen. So let's take a look. We hope you consider submitting feedback. Um, so the first check here is review and comment on each work group draft as it's posted, because that's when the feedback goes straight back to the work group. And they are the most likely ones to make the edits. Let the work group know um, that you have specific knowledge that something could and should be changed in a very specific way. I will tell you that at one time during the streamlining, and I don't know how many of you remember this, but topographic maps were going to be removed from the middle school teaks. And there were letters from hundreds of educators around the state um, giving arguments for retaining topographic maps. They were retained. And this would make a difference for some of you. Um, and, and this can happen for any specific section. Um, so let's take a look. This is a good way, a recommended way of giving written feedback if you're gonna do it. Just short and sweet. Um, it is, it is very specific. It gives the, the, the uh, this is kindergarten 1B in that first line, eliminate this standard. Um, if you add the word um, discuss to 1A, this will no longer be needed. So very, very specific, very actionable. Um, let me show you some other examples. This is the kind of feedback we have gotten sometimes. This is an example of something that's hard to move on. It's hard, it's hard to 
get all the way through to find out exactly um, what needs to be done, even though it says in that paragraph, the suggested removal of 6H is of greatest concern. It, it may be something that um, board members may not, and, and committee members may have trouble taking a look at that. Um, so, this is um, an example of some feedback that is, is, um, doesn't exactly name the teaks. Um, however, look at this comment. Um, this says, please do not strike language in biology, student expectations, 3A, 7B, 7G, and 9D. Um, so these are very specific um, and, and um, are very helpful. Here we have, um, Again, something that's a paragraph. And it, and it just, it, it may not get fully translated to the work groups, by the work groups, to the board members. We need something that is uh, more specific. So here are examples again that are um, helpful. So, here we have the best practices um, for, they can go to the work group drafts in the public hearings and during that official comment period. We hope that you as, um, as educators, as science um, specialists and as members of the public will consider giving feedback. Now I have a, a, a quite a bit of information that we're going to talk about later as we get started um, looking at the science and engineering practices because they make quite a difference in our science teaks. And a lot of you, I think, um, in, include the scientific processes in your materials. And so I want to make sure you have an understanding of that. So we are going to go into that um, in the second part of this presentation um, a little later on. Um, we have, we're, I'm really pleased that we have um, Colin here with us and Colin, will you say hello and introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. Hello, everybody. My name is Colin Sambello, and I am a reading language arts specialist for TEA. And um, I'm here um, at Irene's invitation mm -hmm. to um, just to talk with you all and, and to do a short 30-minute uh, uh, writing roundtable. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I love, you know, I, I've, I have a huge passion for writing. And so uh, when our team was offered the opportunity to participate, I, I jumped at the chance to talk about writing. So, um, and, and um, while I, I do not have a science background, um, I have always enjoyed when I was an English teacher, um, bringing in um, science and social studies themed texts into my classroom. So. Um, it's great to be here with you, and, and I'm ready to start whenever you like, Irene. Thank you so much. It's so good to see you. I'm so glad you could join us. Would, would you just um, start by um, saying a few words about the whole reading language arts, your whole team? What are you responsible for? So the reading language arts team at TEA is responsible for um, 
a number of, of things that, that support K-12 education. Um, one of those things is to, um, to work directly with the standards and to make sure that we provide resources to teachers and educators and, and students and parents and all stakeholders to provide re, uh, resources on our website and through various forms of outreach like this to make sure that everybody has everything that they need to know to understand what their role is and, and how best to implement learning um, for both for, for all dimensions of, of uh, English language arts, be it reading and decoding, be it um, writing and communication and composition. So we, as a result of that, we also work on all of the components for reading and writing for the STAR test. So that does take uh, you know, a, a fair amount of our time working on ensuring that those items are fair and that content is rigorous and at a high level and um, you know the commissioner now has us focusing on making sure that we make, like I said earlier, those connections to various content areas, and science is one of them that they're they're wanting to highlight. So, you know, this is some of the the major pieces of work that we do in in RLA, and our team is um, right now we're a small but but a mighty team of um, it's our director Shalane. And then it's I and three other colleagues, and we're hoping to get a little bit bigger in the near future. But um, yeah, you can um, you can you can find our various resources on our on the website, and you can always reach out to us. Um, and I'll I'll make sure to include my email. And I know you have Irene, so she can always pass along any questions you have to us as well. Colin. Um, do you want to share your one pager or um, do you just want to speak first? You can, you can go ahead and share your screen if you'd like. Okay, yeah, I will, um, I'll get set to do that. So let me, um, let me pull up my, my document here and I'm just going to share I was mindful that you know, with the with the with roughly thirty minutes here, I didn't want to do a really lengthy PowerPoint presentation. Um, basically, wanted to make sure I could, you know, ha have participation and and leave room for questions and for you, for you to exchange ideas a little bit. So, I'm just going to talk a little bit as I share my screen here. And, and good, see. and just to let you know, Linda will be able to share your questions um, are typed on some pages when we get to that point, okay. if that's something you'd like. Sure, that would be great. So um, since this is a writing, you know, a, a writing focus here at this, or at our little round table, um, I just wanted to go over kind of um, four very general categories or modes of writing that you can keep in mind when you're, you know, thinking in terms of what would be good to convey to learners of, you know, of all different ages and grade levels. So the first I'll start with is expository writing. And expository, um, you know, may not be a term that you come across a lot in your everyday experiences or life. So that's simply writing that is informative or explanatory. Um, it's, it's common to have especially the younger grades, elementary grades, get a lot of practice in explanatory writing because it's a good way of getting a sense of whether students are obtaining certain concepts clearly and digesting things fully. So, you know, examples would include news reports, scientific articles, and could include procedural documents like how-to instructions. Um, there's, a, there's a great amount of value in being able to be a good expository writer. Um, and I'm sure all of you working in the scientific domain uh, appreciate that because being able to break things down and convey them to an audience that may not be strong, have a strong background, but being able to convey those concepts and, and, and put them into terms and paradigms that, that people of all walks of life can understand and all different levels can understand. That's obviously highly valuable. And then um, narrative, 
is something that is simply telling a story. It could include things like really short pieces like anecdotes. It could include short stories, novels, and obviously autobiographies and biographies. And I've always felt like narrative is useful for generating interest or sparking um, you know, uh, some, some anticipation or attention from someone that you're, you're looking to convey ideas to because, you know, it's a good tool. You know, I found it, I've, I've found it, you know, in, in pretty much a lot of the work that I did in the classroom with students and I've encountered it as a reader that often, um, a brief anecdote or periodically, you know, providing anecdotal experiences or, or stories helps to illustrate certain things that could generate more interest in, what, in someone wanting to do a little bit more research about a topic. Um, and certainly, um, you know, biographies by, by, uh, by scientific, by scientists and, and science experts, you know, obviously have those elements of what I mentioned earlier in expository because um, you could have a story of someone's life or experiences where you're conveying those discoveries that they made or those things that they encountered. And it's sort of laying out in a linear narrative that can be easily followed. And then, especially as we get to middle school and, um, and to high school, argumentative writing plays more and more of a role. We do introduce argumentative writing at a very um, simple level as early as grade three, but it, it sort of especially takes center stage, like I said, as students are able to get more experience with things like research. So when we say argumentative, um, we want to make sure that we convey that it's not necessarily um, the sort of the sense of arguing but it's, it, it's, it involves that idea of advancing and supporting ideas, and in some cases, positions or policies. And it could include editorials. Um, I'm including persuasive writing here, but persuasive writing has a little, has very specific elements to it. So persuasive writing will have those pieces like, you may be interested in, in sort of pushing for people to take a certain action so you'll see that call to action, and you may see a little bit more in persuasive writing um, using sort of um, strategies like to, to appeal to people's emotions or sense of right and wrong. So that, that's sort of a parallel or, or related uh, important piece of, uh, of argumentative writing. Research is often really a key piece of this. And sort of one of the things as I was putting together this brief guide, you know, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson kind of jumped right out to mind as a, as a good example of a longer form piece of argumentative writing. Um, and obviously in that work, she, she, she definitely does some expository or some explaining to it as she moves to, you know, express or convey her thesis about the, the harm of DDT being done to the environment and things that we need to do to safeguard the, the natural environment. And then I, one that I, uh, when I discussed with my team, um, one of my teammates reminded me to talk about correspondence. So, you know, when we think of correspondence, we think, you know, a century ago, we would have th thought primarily of, you know, um, letters, formal letters and things like that. And now that can include obviously electronic communications like emails, correspondence can be formal or informal. They can be, you know, literally just an exchange between just two people, or it can be something like an open letter that's conveyed, you know, for, for wide, wide consumption. And correspondence is especially valuable, um, you know, not in a non-scientific, um, you know, example here when I was, discovering one of my favorite pieces of uh, genres of music, jazz. Uh, I once sat down and wrote a letter to the jazz great Sonny Rollins. Um, and he sent me a card back in the mail, a really beautiful card with a personal message in it. And so for my whole life, I've remembered that as, as the power of communication and reaching out to people 
And so I think that, you know, especially with science being really at the forefront, with, you know, our investigation of, um, you know, energy innovation and with what's happening in our, in, with climate change and the environment, you know, the, the importance of being able to out, make outreach and, and initiate collaboration is particularly valuable. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a framework to, that you can think about, um, you know, in terms of these four general modes, you know, and they're not exclusionary, you know, correspondence could tend to include elements of, of the other three. And um, so they're, they're, they're there is not always a, a, a rigid category here, you know, um, it, sometimes just what you're moved to write or you're, you feel inspired to write to convey your ideas, you know, um, it could have elements of, of several of these here. So with that in mind, um, I thought I might introduce my first um, poll question. So if, um, if you want to set that up for me, Irene. I think you're on mute. It is not, it's not presented as a poll, but as a okay. question. Sure, sure. And people are going to respond in the chat. Um, and, and you also, Colin, can invite them to unmute and to just speak up for a few minutes. Absolutely. Um, we're, we want to hear, um, we, I want to have y'all participate. So there's more than one voice going. And so, so feel free to enter some information in the chat and, um, you know, feel free to, to chi unmute yourself and chime in. We're looking forward to getting a good exchange of ideas. I see, I saw Henrietta Lacks, Aldo Leopold. Richard Louvre, fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad that the Silent Spring example, um, you know, feels, feels relevant. And here's another one, braiding sweetgrass. Okay. Oh, Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets. And Tiffany, do you want to say a little bit about braiding sweetgrass? In case you want to expound um, yeah, a little that's a book that I read, well, I listened to the audio book uh, this summer when I was driving a lot. And uh, it's written by a naturalist who has spent her life in education. And uh, she was a, a professor. And it was, it's, I'm not sure if it's, if it would fit under narrative might be the best place it would go. But she <laughs> has a really wonderful way of taking um, anecdotes from her life and how she um, incorporates the natural world into becoming a better person and a mom and a teacher and everything she learned from nature, but also it, it's very high level mm -hmm. um, science too. So I felt really inspired by reading it and how, you know, what I do in the environment and as an educator makes me, um, you know, a more well-rounded human and a, a better teacher too. So, excellent. Thank you for that input. That's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna bookmark that book for my own uh, consideration as well. So this is a great list. So everything from the Indigo Girls to poetry, mm -hmm. and I I'm sorry I didn't include poetry because. Um, mm -hmm. Poetry can obviously be very inspirational and, and have that some of those same elements that I said were part of the values or benefits of, of storytelling. So absolutely, I, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to recognize the, the value and power of poetry, even in, the, in sharing ideas in the scientific domain. Old Man in the Sea, um, great to see that. Oh, the book about Tesla. that to see. This is wonderful. So I invite you all to, if you see, if you see, if you would, for any of you who would like to talk about any of these 
any of these texts, I would love to have any of you chime in. Oh, the Lorax. My, my, I have a three-year-old daughter and we, we recently introduced her to the Lorax. We, we love it. Bird Baylor, a separate piece. That's another familiar one from my, from my area. This is great. This is such a fantastic list. Can, can, um, can we hear about a little bit about the children's author, Bird Baylor? I'm curious about that. I think my focus is often in the upper grades, but I would love to hear a little bit about some children's writing. I was the one who I think mentioned her. Um, okay. I'm Angel Poe. I work at Mitchell Lake Audubon Center down in San Antonio. My prior life to being an environmental educator, I was a first grade teacher for a number of years um, and kind of got into environmental education for sh by sharing my own passion for the outdoors with my students. Um, but Bird Baylor was someone that I found. I lived in the Mojave Desert out in Las Vegas and uh, sh she's very focused on the natural world of the desert and through poetry, through really um, intense, beautiful imagery, she kind of explains the desert to children. Um, and she does it, it's it, all of her work is, is poetry or imagery focused. It's not, there's no real narrative to it. Um, and it's not necessarily scientific, but I would use it to help spur environmental inquiry in my students because they would read, you know, they would hear the imagery, see the pictures in the book, and then want to go like pick up a rock for themselves and really look at it. Does it really sparkle? Are there really crystals in a rock and that kind of thing? So I found that through the um, through the the imagery she uses, it sparks scientific inquiry in children. Angela, I actually have the books within reach. So um, if it'll flip oh, where okay. I can see it. She's yeah, talking about everybody needs a rock. And so just to kind of show you some of the pictures out of it, um, she does a really great job of showing those. And then I, one of my favorites is, guess who my favorite person is? Um, and it's one about a little girl and a young man um, sitting in the wild. Sorry, I can't turn the pages sitting in the wild of the grass and just starting a friendship and talking about their favorite things around the earth and um, the table where rich people sit. And it's a kid who thinks she's very, very poor. And then as her parents start um, giving prices, asking her, what does it cost to live in nature and to see these wonderful things every day? She realizes how rich she really is in her life. And another way to start a day is another one she thought, uh, which is about sunrise. So these are all very, very good. Grab them for you. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so glad to um, hear hear all of your input. Please go ahead. I have. Now I don't have a specific book to reference. I know that we've been working a lot on PD, and we've been focusing on like cultural stories of science and how to add culturally responsive teaching across the board and just being. Um, really, really aware of um, making sure that we include um, in our science programs and our after school programs and our PD that we're including references, materials, books um, that really reference women. Um, and that's why I've put a bunch of these like books about Nancy Roman, you know, the, the mother of Hubble and things like that. Um, uh, but you also want to make sure that you're you're, you're hitting people in your classes, you're hitting people that, you know, you're speaking to Native American culture, you're, you're looking at African American culture, um, Hispanic culture and multitudes, and it's not just Mexico, and maybe it's El Salvador stories from Guatemala, so that you're really getting to see a lot more of the rich experience of those cultural stories. And storytelling is such a great way to introduce science. Um, you know, you, you can talk to people about 
you know, the, the three sisters story, which is a great environmental science story that you can then incorporate that the, the mythology of the story of the three sisters and how that goes with companion gardening and, and how you know what to plant, when to plant and how to, how to make things happen. And then it's, it, it involves that Native American culture. Um, and I think things like that are really important, you know, when you want to get in that science time. So um, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amber. Yeah, and, uh, and now, you know, your various suggestions are making me think of, you know, all sorts of uh, different kinds of pieces that I've encountered, you know, whether it's about like an inventor like Garrett Morgan, or, um, you know, I recently got a book for my, my daughter uh, called We Are Water Protectors. And it's by an author named Carol Lindstrom, who is, um, uh, a tribally enrolled it's, member of a tribe. It's in, in brilliant. Nebraska. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun reading that with my daughter. And I, I, I see her thinking about the, 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 the idea of how, how we're affecting the environment and how we have to advocate for the environment and, you know, and seeing girls and women stepping up and, and taking voices and, 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 and thinking about the experience of, of indigenous people. Yeah, I think on, on that topic as well, like CBS Sunday Morning has produced several different um, shows all about the, the Navajo Water Woman. And just recently here this past summer, they did another one about um, still those um, indigenous cultures living without water. They also talked about people in West Virginia. So again, in terms of like standards in the classroom and in looking at environmental science, you know, everybody thinks that water is only an issue of a third world country. There's plenty of places in the United States and you can really bring that in and you can make it relevant. You can make that content, you know, engaging to where, hey, this is people that are, you know, there's some places in Texas where the water is not safe to drink. Let's make this a, a discussion. And there's plenty of literature on the topics and videos and cool things to incorporate and wonderful ideas for expository writing. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, I think this is a good springboard here while we have, I think, about in our in our window, about eight minutes or so. I think um, I'll move maybe if we can, Irene, to springboard to actually talk about our experiences with writing and our, our successes that we may have had with different uh, efforts at writing. Let's let's introduce that second question if we can. So what are some examples of writing that you've used or facilitated that have been engaging or useful? Um, you know, you can enter your answers in the chat and we'll have some more um, verbal exchange as well. And, um, you know, I gave my example of, of, of my letter writing experience and getting a reply. That could be, it could be something like that, something that you've published, whether it's on a blog or to a wider audience. So see acrostic poems. Yeah, persuasive writing. Haiku is great. Songs, yes. Nature journaling, great. And so as, as we, we see some really great suggestions and experiences in the chat, if any of you wanna chime in and just put a little, put a little elaboration on your experience. It never passed the Clean Air Act. Great. So I wrote acrostic poems because that's what we use most often at work. We'll sit outside and do a five minute sit and they'll sketch what they saw. So that's their nature journaling portion, portion of it. And then they write an acrostic poem uh, based on their topic for that day. So it might be an animal that they're studying that day, or it might be a plant they're studying that day, or it might be a, the word habitat because they're looking at the parts of the habitat. Um, so we use that a lot, but I love that nature journaling came up so many times because that is my true passion. So thank y'all. 
Yes. <laughs> Superb. Thank you. We have two uh, a curricula, integrated curriculum, integrates math, science, English, and social studies, and it starts out with a narrative story. Uh, and since social studies is different, uh, six, seven, eight, three to different places, if it was world history, we went to see the Taj Mahal. We went to see uh, uh, the uh, different different parts of, of the different countries. And uh, there was a story about someone getting sick uh, in there and that set up our environmental health science thing. So we had that. And our One Health integrate, uh, One Health curriculum that we're working on now has a little narrative story that we have. So we, 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 we hired a child's writer in one place and then now we use uh, graduate students in the writing uh, uh, a curriculum that writes a little story to set up the, the, uh, uh, the lesson that uh, follows it. Oh, that's great. Larry, thank you for sharing that. That's exactly why I wanted to make sure we, you know, I, I, um, I gave you all a chance to share ideas because this is exactly, you know, coming from each of you, you know, the ability to share ideas is, you know, as, when I was a teacher in the classroom, that was one of the biggest opportunities for me was to get ideas from my fellow teachers. Absolutely, journaling is so important. It's always nice to write a poem to your mother or something. <laughs> I think we really need to talk to the kids these days and really see what kind of media they like and they listen to. Um, I put in the chat, Team Trees. Uh, my middle schooler, I got a chance to, um, to uh, social distance with him in the Hill Country um, for the finals part of his eighth grade year. He kept um, hearing me talk about a garden, so he grew me a garden. He really enjoyed the outdoors and understood um, the importance of gardening. Um, and during that time, he also shared with me his, his favorite YouTubers, of which Mark Rober was one of them. And Mark Rober and, um, and another one, and they were able to hashtag Team Trees and, and raise $200 million in like a month. And, and we sit here with all of our, uh, our YouTube videos and our this, but we're not actually talking to our high schoolers. They are, my kids are the iGen generation. They don't know anything about a smartphone. And I was listening to someone last night and they, they were reminding me as a parent that you know a phone can be as important as a computer. And I'm thinking, you need to be reminded our kids know more about the phone usage than we do because of where we are. I'm, I'm not Boomer, I'm Gen X. Um, and waited a while to have kids. But we really need to talk to our middle high school kids to see what is most effective to them because we can talk amongst ourselves, but we need to hear from them. Um, and what is going to move them not just to protest and request the government to do something, but to actually take action and see that their action makes a difference because that's what's gonna make them feel good. Rebecca, I agree with that. And I've also had experience where students participating in our uh, Earth Science High School internship don't have access uh, to computers at their home. We had a homeless student. We couldn't get the certifications returned because they only had access through their phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, providing opportunities and UT has now provided the opportunity for teachers uh, to be able to sign those documents remotely through their phone. So uh, we just need to be aware of what access students have and really listen to them and tune into that. And my, my son actually, it was kind of a, um, it was a growing experience for both of them. We were, we were in the hill country where there is no internet. There, there is no internet that I couldn't get it. So he had to use his iPad or his phone. He was on cell service to finish his eighth grade year. Yeah. So um, he, he was challenged and he took the challenge. And I think being out in nature is actually what, what, what did it for him is, yeah, he knocked out his homework, but then he got outside and actually used his hands, so. That's great. This is it's it, thank you all for bringing that up because, um, you know, I, I know in my own experience, there are times when, you know, I or, or friends of mine, when we're 
we, we shift sometimes from texting to sending recorded messages to each other that are maybe 45 seconds long because it's easier than, than typing out and texting that message. So I think, and so, some of you in the chat mentioned podcasts, I've become a huge podcast listener over the past five years. And, um, you know, we've, in our, in our work that we just did recently to provide suggestions for implementing our English language arts teaks, a lot of the teachers we spoke with suggested, including whether it was in these composition standards, writing, you know, or responding to their reading, we've included a lot uh, that, that um, allows them to consider using electronic platforms, having students have the chance to maybe respond by creating like a, their own version of a podcast or responding electronically in a, in a blog format. So thank you all for bringing that up because we know this is increasingly a way that people have shifted from writing, you know, on a keyboard, you know, at, at a, you know, I mentioned before that, you know, correspondence a hundred years ago would have just basically meant about one thing. Now correspondence can take about seems like six or seven different forms, and that's all the also the case with, with with various kinds of composition. So we I think we we've, we've right around hit my limit for for our for our roundtable here. I'm just going to enter my email in the chat just in case you'd like to have it, um, and. I invite you all to, um, you know, to steal or jot down as many, I'm sure you have been, as many ideas as you can get from, from the chat. There's my contact information. Um, this has been so much fun and I, I hope that I've provided a little bit of value and, and I hope that this 30 minutes has been useful to you. I know I've taken away some, some ideas and, and a few suggestions. Um, for, for children's books for my daughter, as well as um, some things that I might be interested in reading. And um, TEA really thanks you for your participation here. And, and you know, if you have any questions before I hop off, I'm, um, I'm happy to answer them. I don't mean to steal the show, but I do have to say my child transitioned from a, a public school to a private school and both of them did it at different times. And I am thrilled that writing is going to take, um, to take precedent. Um, both of them struggled mightily going from a public, public school to a private school because their writing was not up to, to, to par. And I absolutely love the four ways that you broke down writing. Um, and, and our kids do not have, they're seriously because of, of iPhones, don't have the mental capacity to even listen to an I, I, a, a podcast for 30 minutes. We have to come up with quicker snippets and give them more exciting ways to share their ideas and give them a voice, thanks. Absolutely. From one, uh, as another Gen Xer, Rebecca, I, I hear you and, and I appreciate your input. Colin, thank you so much. And before we let you go entirely, if there's one thing that you could um, ask TIAC providers to English language arts and reading and writing students with, What's one thing you would ask of our TIAC providers to keep in mind as, as we move forward this year? Um, I guess just that idea that I mentioned in the correspondence, you know, that, that writing can be formal or informal. And so, you know, think about, think about your audiences, you know, and think about, you know, whether you want to have a narrow audience or, or, a, or a wider audience. Think about what the best way to present your information is, and and go with it. You know, you you know, do what, go go where where um where you find the inspiration, and where you find the the excitement and the energy and the engagement, and um, as you do that, you'll 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 hit upon things that young people are interested in, and you'll be able to to support their their interest in learning, and you and you may help them discover things that they. That they may want to find for you know get involved in for a career track or or just just for the love of learning so um thank you all for participating and you know and 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 definitely check in you know and and check out our resources at at um 
tea.texas.gov. And um, we're, we, we are on the topic of writing, we are going to be interest, introducing writing items and, and writing responses, not just in grades four and seven. So you're going to see a little bit more writing coming forth on the STAR test. And we're doing our best to make sure that it's fair, that it's brought along um, in a fashion that where students have the opportunity to get their feet under them and, and get familiar and practice those skills and develop those abilities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Colin. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Have a great one and enjoy, enjoy your Thank conference. You. So we, I um, have been in correspondence um, with our next presenter, who I told you, Barney Fudge, is unable to join us. He has a bill analysis that was given to him this morning, and he has to complete it by the end of the uh, end of the day. Um, and he has more bill analyses to do around legislatively introduced bills than anybody on our staff. He always wins the award every year for, <laughs> for um, being overwhelmed with 30 or 40 bills he has to analyze. So, um, I, but I have, I, I'm going to, um, I am going to my screen with you. You'll see the email from Barney and a link. And I want to take some time to show you what is in the, in the proposed rules. So you can, we can take a look at some of the, the physical education um, rules. Um, so you're going to just watch me, I hope, um, navigating here um, in just a moment. Let's see. Um, okay. So I just shared that link. Oh, you did. Oh, good. Yeah. So everybody, folks, you can go there yourself if my screen is not big enough. Yeah, we're what looking gonna, at your email now. I know you are. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to show you my navigation here, but um, this is proposed rules um, right here. You, you're going to be scrolling down to Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills for Health Education. Oh, Irene, we're still looking at your email. You did. I'm sharing my screen. That's what I. Yeah, see. but you're sharing. Okay. But you shared your your Outlook window. You didn't share your whole desktop. Oh. So you okay. have to unshare and then reshare that. Let me. Okay. Um, if you go to this link yourself, and I. And I, I recommend that you consider doing this, especially if you have um, two, two screens or, or something like that. Um, then um, let me share this. Um, okay. Ah, that's better. Yes. All right. Thank you. So when you get to that link, it's not the first thing you see is what I'm trying to tell you. you Got to scroll down um, to proposed rules with closed public comment periods. And by the way, on your, on your moving along here, notice that um, the high school courses um, have, are already there. These are proposed um, rules, but the comment periods ha um, have been closed. Okay, so next we, we get health education and then physical education. And so I'm gonna open the, the PE cheeks and, um, and here's the PE cheeks for the the elementary school. Now you can't really read my screen very well, but I want to let you know that Barney, when he was talking with us 
at an earlier meeting to, so he could prepare for this um, was, was letting us know that um, some of the new things that were happening were going to be um, a new outdoor education course um, um, at the high school level, which he thought was um, a very exciting thing. And students could take this maybe in conjunction with some of you if, if uh, what you do has um, a lot of, of um, physical movement. But just to, to show you, you know, there are movement patterns and movement skills. Some of you incorporate hikes, for example, or virtual hikes. So students are uh, aware of spatial and body awareness and, um, and they're moving through um, some dynamic activities and that could be um, seining, that could be netting butterflies. Um, this could be a whole set of, of movement. You, can, you are um, in a position to really offer um, um, an, an ancillary help to districts in, in uh, their physical education. So um, here we have number seven, and I understand this is hard to read, but it says outdoor and recreational pursuits. The physically literate student demonstrate competency in outdoor and recreational pursuits. The student is expected to demonstrate a, a variety of correct techniques for outdoor recreational skills, like maybe archery, for example, um, maybe um, activities uh, such as gardening, maybe games um, such as um, Odeer in Project Wild. So, you know, you can be looking at these now. They have been adopted by the board. If you want to link to these, they are available right now for you to link to. Um, Barney also was um, wanted, was letting you know that in addition to physical education, um, schools have a requirement for physical, physical activity. And again, that can be something where they are collecting rocks. They are um, moving about um, with binoculars, bird watching. Uh, so please keep this in mind as well. Um, I'm just gonna take another few minutes here. Um, but here we have um, under PE, health, physical activity, fitness, um, environmental awareness and safety practices. So it says the physically literate student demonstrates competency in, in environmental awareness and understands safety practices. So here the, the, uh, the student has to um, show the, the use of proper um, attire and safety equipment. Um, so if they're outdoors and they're going to take a hike where there's poison ivy, you know, long pants, for example, and you do that kind of thing, some of you, in, in working with your students. Um, and so they have to perform without cue the correct safety precautions, um, including water, sun cycling, skating, and scooter safety. Um, there's also social and emotional health, which I think um, we really, in the area of environmental education, have a lot to offer students. And this can overlap with the health teaks as well, the new health teaks. I'm not gonna open them now and look at them because again, this is 
um, a small screen and this is not Barney fudge, um, but I just wanted to show you that these are here. Um, I, I invite you to take a look at this um, on, on throughout the health cheeks uh, for each of the every grade and um, as well as the PE. And Barney thought this year with these new cheeks, you would have better links in the, in the PE cheeks, not the health cheeks necessarily. But I wanna encourage you to, to copy that link that Kiki put down there, take a look at that and see what you can do to help schools. These are not gonna be adopted for several years. You can work with schools to prepare for this. Um, and I see we're, we're getting some um, comments here um, that, you, that um, you might want to take a look at as well in the comment box. Um, so I, I wanna just spend a moment inviting folks to use either the chat or to speak up and say, what do you do now? Or how could you link to the physical education teaks and help schools um, meet their requirements? So, oh, Susan, I am not, let me, let me look again, because I still have that up. Um, in environmental awareness, um, I am going to, I was in, I think, grade seven, and that was knowledge and skill statement 11 in grade seven. But I see here environmental awareness. Um, I, now that I, the more I look at that, the more it looks like it just means awareness of your body and the environment. You know, don't go outside without an umbrella. Um, but we can look at that and see if it has more, uh, uh, more um, um, more depth to it. Um, and and um, I am not sure if that's for all the grade levels. Um, but I think, um, again, from Susan, you use safety gear, cave helmets, et cetera. So this is really uh, an, an important contribution that you can make. I'm not sure it's true for all the grade levels. You'll have to, to uh, look at that. So for those of us on the call who are part of the Texas Children and Nature Network or have been part of Cities Connecting Children to Nature, we, are, we constantly know that the challenge of getting our kids outside working and learning in um, natural learning environments is that there's no um, related TEKS. So we've been always looking for how do you correlate the TEKS to, to, uh, to working outside. So I don't know, is there some place that I can go to to, um, to see that correlation? And this is beautiful because, for example, you know, a garden, that there's a fabulous uh, graphic, 101 things to teach in a garden, um, very clearly, but, but it gave the general, like math, you learn this, that, and the other, but it didn't give it to a TEKS. Has anybody correlated the TEKS, as many TEKS as possible to uh, teaching outdoors? I would be surprised if anybody has made the correlation yet to these new TEKS since they were just adopted. They're brand new, but perhaps we can make a pact among ourselves that if any anybody does correlation, that you can um, maybe send it to me, and I will I will send it to 
all the TAC providers. If, if anybody's got something in the short term right away, um, we can share it. But these, are, these have just been adopted by the board. So, Irene, Irene yeah. we, at Re we at Region 10 are partnering with the um, Boy Scouts and using their camps and we're developing a grade level specific curriculum, including cross curricular approaches. And we will be collecting the teaks for that and I will share that with you. Holly, what a <laughs> gift to your fellow TF providers. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No sense in reinventing the wheel. Well, fantastic. Well, this is great news. Well, I think it's time to take a break. Yep, and it looks like people are beginning to appear back in their little boxes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Welcome back to your little box. One, one person in a box to another. <clears throat> So we're ready for our first spotlight. So Elizabeth, Cindy, I don't, if you are there, you are welcome to start speaking and you can share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, I am here and I'm actually on camera. Elizabeth is the person behind the, the curtain today. Elizabeth, are you there? I am here. All right, and there's our I'm screen. setting up our window before I share screen. Making sure it's on the right side when we start. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I had right, it set she... and then I had to add one more thing. Oh yeah, we had decided to add something fun at the end. Um, so Elizabeth and I both work for the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. And we are a quasi-state agency. We're located in Seguin, Texas. Uh, but we actually serve 10 counties in the Guadalupe River Basin. So we had uh, put this presentation together back when CAST was going on and basically just walking through what we have done to try to continue to stay relevant with uh, schools and teachers, students, and the general public uh, during the time of COVID. <clears throat> All right, Liz. All right, here we go. Hopefully. Yay. All right, so we, it, we did already have an online program basically targeting seventh grade teachers and students. It's called Waters to the Sea. Uh, this is a second version of that, and it uh, is online 24 7, 365. It's an interdisciplinary program that uh, takes students on a river journey. It's basically a story map. So, Liz, if you want to click on that, we can show them what that looks like. If you're not familiar with the story map, uh, I don't know, it's kind of self-explanatory. If you click on River Journey, yeah. We have uh, a map. <laughs> and basically what we do is we walk the students down the river basin, starting at the headwaters up in uh, Kerr County and continuing all the way down to the coast. And then we have a lot of uh, different videos with embedded in this. We have uh, learning modules embedded in it. We have uh, some histories, uh, these heritage tours embedded in it. So it is just an amazing resource. It's got so much information. I have heard from the developers of this that they are working on a Trinity version as well. The Trinity uh, had had one at one time, but a lot of it was programmed in Flash, so they're revamping it. And it's going to look a lot, uh, an awful lot like this one. So we've had this up, uh, we finished it up, I believe last spring, um, trying to reach out to teachers, of course was impossible. Uh, we decided to try to do uh, an online training. And so we put together a training, it's about three hours long. Uh, and so we put that up over the summer, I think we put it up in June or so. So just a way to try to continue with our professional development. All right, back to the slideshow. So, you know, we're learning we have to be able to throw things up online in order to stay engaged. So our next slide, um, most of the time during a typical school year, we would be out and about up and down the river basin working 
with students in outdoor settings. We, we don't really have our own site. We do have the Canyon Lake Gorge, but the programming we have there is specific to only fifth grade. So we typically would go out and about to state parks and other parks and nature centers, environmental centers, outdoor learning centers, and present water lessons. Uh, since we are not allowed to do that anymore, or rather the students aren't allowed to have field trips, we decided to take some of the more, uh, I guess, highly requested lessons on the road. So we put together some traveling trunks. Uh, these are all, of course, TEKS oriented. We have them available for loan for one week, and this is anywhere in 10 counties. We will deliver them for free, and we're in the middle of doing that right now. I think Liz has to leave early today to take care of some trunks. Uh, but we decided, you know, we need to not only make them available, we have to make it uh, obvious to the teachers how this is going to benefit them. So we put together some videos and websites specific to the trunks. If you click on that elementary one, Liz. So we, um, on our GBRA website, we have a, an introductory video. And uh, so that's me. And that's just to introduce all four elementary trunks. And then within that or below that, we have four different uh, videos that take us a deeper dive into each of these trunks. So we have one on uh, water properties, one on the water cycle, one on using stream erosion models and one on sedimentary rock and fossils. And so teachers can watch those videos, try to decide if that's gonna be applicable to their classroom and they can sign up to borrow those and they can also sign up to borrow some of our models. So we have the four middle school trunks as well as uh, the elementary trunks and our middle school trunks are all, all four of them are using lessons from a program called Project WET, which is an international program. And we decided to use those Project WET activities because Project WET has online versions of those exact same lessons. So if teachers have some students learning at home and some students in the classroom, they'd all be using the exact same content. And so we uh, were having a little bit of trouble getting through to the teachers, you know, we try to work directly with the school districts and coordinate with school district science uh, staff. But I think everybody is just so overwhelmed back in March and even now that it was really hard to get their attention to let them know that these, these things were available. So we decided to approach it by um, basically spoon feeding them. So we put together what we call a poster for each of our larger school districts. You'll note on this one, it says Lockhart ISD. So we uh, requested the YAGs, which are uh, basically the calendars for when teachers are teaching what. And we uh, put together a poster for each individual district. So you can see on the right there, it says stream erosion models, uh, science teaks, grades four, uh, grades five, and what grade, during what grading period the teachers are teaching that. So we're basically telling them, hey, you can use this the third nine weeks, which is actually right now. So we found that we are getting a lot more traction, I think, because of the way that we approached our marketing to the specific districts. So when the teachers get that flyer or poster, they can uh, click on that link at the bottom and that takes them to those same videos and the calendar where they can make their reservations. And the next slide shows you that we have had some programs in place for a number of years. This one's our fourth grade program. Uh, it's been around since 1985 with a lot of revisions, but it still is very popular with fourth grade students and teachers. So we've had some of the teachers that use this typically during the year to ask us if we could make this available electronically. So we have done that. We've taken some of the student workbook, put it into Google Slides and uh, Typically what we do is we mail a kit of these uh, in a box. So if you have four classes at a school, we would send four sets of 25 booklets to a school and they divide it up amongst the teachers. Teachers would distribute them and, and use these booklets to teach. Uh, now it's all uh, electronic as well. So on some of these pages, we actually have uh, areas for students to uh, uh, fill in, yeah, there to uh, show that they have uh, demonstrate, they want to demonstrate their understanding of some of these concepts. So we put that out, the teachers can make a copy of this and send it out through their Google Classroom or Seesaw or whatever they're using. 
and decide how they want to use it from there. And we also have uh, this available in our Spanish version as well. So those have just gone up this, uh, this month and I think we're starting to see some traction on those as well. Back to the slideshow, Viz. <clears throat> um, we also have virtual lessons. We, I, that's me in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, early on in March, I typically would spend a lot of time in middle, middle school classrooms teaching uh, about watersheds and non-point source pollution and uh, interconnections between groundwater and surface water. These are all seventh grade science teaks. Uh, and so I had some teachers requesting that I actually send them a video of that particular lesson. So we went out uh, at the office on our back porch and filmed that video, the watersheds lesson. And we've also are starting to put together a group of lessons that we're gonna have available online. We're putting together a blog right now. We, we can't really have a Google Classroom since we're not in a school, but we're trying to find our way around that by um, putting together a blog where we can send things out to teachers through the blog. And then ideally they can copy them or use them as they see fit. All right, back to the show. All right, um, we do work specifically with one uh, grant. It's a TCEQ grant that we got a few years back. And what we're doing is we're providing water quality education programming through a place called the Seguin Outdoor Learning Center. And we had hired an educator to go out and present lessons to two different school districts at Seguin ISD and Navarro ISD. Uh, again, students were not available to come to the Outdoor Learning Center. So working together with that educator, we put together uh, those lessons to take on the road. If you go back one slide, Liz. So what we ended up doing was purchasing a trailer and having it outfitted so that we could uh, put everything in that trailer. And then we visited the campuses and let them know, we're, we're gonna come to you. We're gonna teach you the exact same lessons as best we can. Uh, and we're gonna do it all outdoors. We use uh, master naturalists uh, volunteers to teach some of these lessons. And we've seen a lot of success with that. Next slide. So, you can see I'm over on the left-hand side. We have a stream table trailer that we take out and about. We've got students working, I think, on bird beak activities in the second uh, or middle part of that slide. And then uh, lessons on wa the watershed that is impaired that we're actually targeting. It's called the Geronimo Creek watershed. And uh, of course, using a non-point source model. We've all been able to reach about 1,150 students through this effort this school year alone. So a few things in here, we can go to the next slide, Liz, that I didn't put in the, uh, in the um, presentation. And that is that we are continuing with professional development. We've done some online trainings. One, uh, we did a Growing Up Wild and Project Wild combo with Kiki's help. Thank you, Kiki. So that's a lot of fun. We're gonna be doing a Project Wet virtual training uh, later on, I believe in February. Um, well, we have found that uh, a good way to try to continue is to pursue grant money. We're chasing grant money for a couple of different projects right now and have our fingers crossed. Another thing that we're continuing this year, we weren't sure if, sure if we were, but we've had a lot of requests, is we do have a composition contest every spring where we have fourth graders. It's kind of a practice ex exercise for their fourth grade star writing test. So we um, have fourth graders write uh, compositions, expository. We have two different prompts that we give them and uh, the teachers then turn them into us and we get to score them. Uh, we've had as many as 2000, so it takes us a while. And uh, typically during the last part of May, we go, what we've done in the past is go out to campuses and give them prizes, things like t-shirts and cups and stickers and things like that. Uh, Last year, I ended up just delivering, or actually into this fall, delivering those prizes to the campuses and hoping that the teachers got them to the students because uh, none of that took place last spring. But the student, many of the students, I think we still had about 1,200 com uh, compositions that had come in prior to spring break. Angie, so right now, we're, yes. Hi, 
Un unfortunately, we need to kind of end this. Oh, right yeah, now. yeah. This is but, our very last um, one. Folks can continue to chat with you at our next break and during lunch. But we're, we, our next speakers are here. Yeah, and so done. thank you. That was awesome and very inspiring. Oh. And so oh. now we have Melissa Lautenschlager, Leslie Patton. They're going to be here from TEA talking to you about Texas home learning. And Melissa, um, will you, and Leslie, will you introduce yourselves and say hi, and then uh, before you move to your slides. Great, thank you. I was enjoying that presentation, so thank you. I know. I, I, uh, <laughs> back, in the, back in the day, I did a lot of work with um, Project Wild and um, work in the Houston area, so exciting to see that. Um, good morning. My name is Melissa Lautenschlager. I'm the Director of Instructional Materials and Implementation at Texas Education Agency. But at heart, I'm a science educator and glad to be here with this group. Um, Leslie and I are going to share some information about Texas home learning and opportunities with the K-5 science plus the other content that's involved. So Leslie, if you'll introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Patton. I am a strategy and operations associate at TEA and also a former science teacher. Um, so extremely excited to be here and share with you guys a really great resource through Texas Home Learning. Wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and make sure that works. And um, we'll get started. So I think that's on. Leslie, can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. You can go ahead and go okay. to the next one. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a short time here, but over the next 30 minutes, um, I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of what Texas Home Learning is. Um, we'll talk through some of the instructional materials that are available through Texas Home Learning, um, share where you can access these. So if we have time, we'll hopefully take you into the website and where these materials are actually being published, um, and then preview some implementation supports and areas of involvement. <clears throat> so Texas Home Learning is an optional aligned suite of resources that educators can use fully or in part in the new learning environment. There's really three buckets of resources within Texas Home Learning. The first one is instructional materials that we're going to spend the majority of our time on today. This is um, pre-K to 12 digitized standards aligned curricular content customized for Texas in this kind of strange environment we're in right now. Um, the second one is technology. Second one is technology um, that includes a two-year free license to Schoology, which is a learning management system um, to support student engagement and instructional collaboration. And that last one is professional development to support educators with implementation both in classroom and remote settings. Um, so it's important to talk about why we're focusing on instructional materials. In the context of our current reality, we know that there's lots of challenges and many ways that we need to respond to meet the needs of students, families, and teachers. Um, so we know that there's a lot of research around why we need to provide high quality instructional materials. Um, and these include things like they provide consistent opportunities to work on assignments aligned to grade level standards. They support strong instruction to ensure that students are deeply engaged in what they're learning. They help students um, meaningfully differentiate for all students. You can click one more time. And then help teachers set high expectations for all students, including those with unfinished learning so they can meet grade level standards because we know that there's gonna be some large learning gaps um, given everything that's happened in the last year. Texas Home Learning is, a, um, is really a full set of resources. So each of the materials include things like unit plans and daily lesson plans aligned to Texas standards. Um, they include teacher, student, and family supports, built-in progress monitoring, formative and summative assessments. All of these are digital formats with printing capabilities, and they have accessibility supports for all learners. These are ideally supposed to be used comprehensively, um, but we encourage districts and teachers and schools to just choose a subset of these or a sample of them to get started and use them as they see fit. Click one more. We are extremely excited to, to announce that to date we have eight um, instructional materials out. So you can see in this chart that we've got materials um, already published that go across pre-K, math, 
um, that's K to 12, ELA and reading, that's also K to 12, Spanish language arts, that's K to five, and then science, which we're gonna dig into today, which is also K to five. We've got um, Spanish language arts skills coming hopefully this spring, and then social studies K to five as well coming this spring. You'll see too that not all the materials are published yet across most of these products. Keep in mind that we are putting these products through all the materials through a rigorous review process. Um, and these are also being completely customized for Texas in this weird environment that we're in. Um, so we're trying to get materials out as quickly as we can, but th there's lots of resources out there already. Um, and after this, I'm gonna hand it over to Melissa to dig into some of these great science resources. Thanks, Leslie. So I'm really excited to jump into um, the science resource for K-5. And I do wanna mention that this resource is available in English and Spanish, which is really exciting um, for our Texas environment and the students that we serve. So the, the product that we selected and are working with is called PhD Science Teaks Edition, and it's published by Great Minds. And this particular product is, is really an exciting approach to science that I, I'm at, I uh, want to have you learn a little bit more about and definitely pause, ask questions in the chat so that I can answer those questions about this product. So one of the things that we all know about science is that we want students to engage in science and problem solving. A high quality materials and lessons do this well. And PhD um, Science Teaks Edition is structured so that it is really rigorous, it's engaging, and it's helping students to build coherent knowledge um, for science and bringing in other content areas. The, as we think about being science educators, we know the importance of science and therefore um, the importance of what this means for building a strong system for students to deeply engage in the content and be involved in thinking and acting like scientists. PhD science helps support students in that by building deep conceptual knowledge engaging in rigorous problem solving, solving, tackling new science content, applying knowledge to new situations, and making lots of connections to other content areas and to other concepts within science. Um, the things that are important here to know is that this particular product is a knowledge building curriculum that is intended to be rigorously engaging because it brings students in with phenomena around them. And so they're actually like taking the science around them and diving deep into that and thinking about phenomena based. So the curriculum integrates scientific investigation and reasoning with the grade level um, scientific concept takes to help students understand core science concepts through the, uh, the exploration of authentic phenomena. And it inspires students truly to wonder uh, about the world. Um, there are, I, would, I wanna mention, because if any of you have looked at it or you have people starting to look at the program, you're going to see that there are some overlaps and modules across grade levels for this year. And that really is intentional because when school just completely changed in March of last year, there were a lot of gaps. And especially we know in elementary school, um, we're, all of you are probably trying to push just as much as Irene and um, all the science team to make sure that elementary science is as rigorous as other grade levels. And so this, uh, there's intentional overlap of modules for this year to make sure that uh, the important concepts that students need to grasp and master by fifth grade are truly um, able to access for that. So in the very first year that we have this, we're seeing some overlap in those modules. There's also some flexibility. And so an entire module could replace a typical unit that somebody's doing in a grade level. So if they were doing earth science, they could use an entire module from um, the, T the PhD science to replace that. And um, 
what's important to know though, it's not just picking and choosing the lessons. The lessons really build upon one another and they're intended to go in a certain sequence to help really build that um, strong understanding of science concepts. I just wanted to share a little bit about um, the important beliefs for the creators of this product and our team that is doing a lot of work with re reviewing. The PhD science really is focused on making sure that students, all students at all times have access. And so they've put up some products in a way that allow remote learning. Nothing is the same as being in the classroom and being able to experience that, but they're trying to find solutions so that students are not missing out on science learning. So interestingly, there's a lot of um, uh, learn anywhere plans are developed that support the the students and teachers about students that might be in a hybrid or a remote setting of how to manage that while kids are in the classroom too. And there are content lesson videos that are really personalized so that it feels like the kid is actually listening to the teacher directly and being able to see what's going on and ask questions and they're appropriate for the grade level. And then there are some teacher um, resources that are really helpful, such as Projected, which provides like a basis of um, um, PowerPoint slides that teachers can build on to help to support with their virtual learning environment instead of creating everything from scratch. And additionally, there are science journals um, or related task sheets that can be both digital or printed so that students are able to participate and access as they go. Um, some other things to note is that uh, we do have implementation supports, but before I jump into this part, I actually would like to take you into the site itself. And uh, you're gonna give me just one moment to navigate, but while I do that, if there's questions and you wanna put them in the chat, Leslie can help me do um, monitor that while I pull up where to access the materials. Melissa, folks have asked if they will have access to the slides. I um, preemptively said that they would because you've been so generous in the past. Is that correct? <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Nothing I'm showing you is a secret. Please share. <laughs> um, thanks, Irene. So Absolutely. I'm right now on the texashomelearning.org site and how you can get access. And I want to show you a few things and I didn't want to put them in the slides, but I'll navigate here is if I want to find uh, my subject, I can go under the navigation bar, find by subject, and we can find science. So you can look at all of the content areas are here, but specifically in science, um, there are ways to um, access the webinars that have been done because they are per, Great Minds is providing some training. But I'm gonna jump into the materials as we go. When you get to this site, this is really the place where you can access and print and pull into your own platform um, all of the materials for PhD science. So I'm going into the curriculum. I'm gonna jump in really quickly to um, a kindergarten lesson and as you can see, there's a few things on here to support. The implementation guide is an excellent resource to see the approach to science and learn more about this product in general. I'd encourage you to visit that a little bit later. I'm gonna jump into module one, which was really about weather. And the focus here was on Mesa Verde and how it um, protected people from the weather. And so um, for this, I think there's just an interesting um, short video I'd love to share with you. And then I'll show you some of the resources. So here's an example of what um, students could have access and kind of the approach from Great Minds. So bear with me. And I know, Leslie, you're gonna have to help me if I mess up the sound, because I feel like I do that often. Okay, I'll let you know. Can you hear it? No? Okay, I'm gonna check. Give me one second, friends. I'm not on this, well, I am on this every day, but um, let me make sure I have. 
Okay, let's try that again. Hi students, and welcome to today's lesson. I'm Ms. Dupre. Today, we are it? going to learn about weather and shelters. Are you ready? I have some friends here today who will be a part of our virtual class. Virtual means that they are not in the same room as me. They are learning virtually, just like you, but they will learn and answer questions along with us. Let's meet them. Our first friend is Finn. Finn, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us something you like to do? My name is Finn and I like to go fishing with my dad. Great to meet you, Finn. Fishing with your dad sounds like so much fun. Our next friend is Enoch. Enoch, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us something you like to do. Name is Enoch and I like monsters. Great to meet you, Enoch. Let's begin our lesson. Have you ever been in a tent? Close your eyes for just a minute and imagine what it would feel like to be in a tent. Where is your tent? Are you in the woods? Maybe you're in a backyard or a park. Do you feel warm or cold? Are you dry or wet? Open your eyes and look at this picture. What do you notice about this picture? To notice means that we look closely at something. Enoch, what do you notice? I see. <laughs> so I'm gonna pause it there, but I really wanted to give you an experience of what these videos are like so that um, we know teachers are creating tons of very amazing things out there, but that's hard to do on a daily basis. And the point here is to take and support the teachers and students in a really strong way. And as you can see from this video, one of the first approaches when students begin a module or a unit is that they start with what they notice and what they know about the world. So it really, um, starts them in a strong place of how is science connected to me, which I think is a really interesting approach to getting our our youngest learners really understanding that science is all around us and it's something that they can do as young scientists. The other parts that, and just to share, all these videos are there for people to use. Um, they're quick, they're about nine minutes at the most, and they have kids do things and answer, and you can see there's participants in there. The other parts that are available within this particular um, product is there is a lot of information for the teacher themselves. So I'm gonna show you just really quickly a couple things and then um, tell me if you can, you give me a thumbs up, Leslie, if you can still see that PDF. Great. So one of the things I love about this is some challenges in elementary science is that not all the people are coming from a science background. And what the module does is it does a great job of introducing what's going to happen in this module and provides the teacher with the information that they need and to understand the science and skills as they progress through the module. Going through this, you can see how, it, how over the course of all of the lessons, students begin to understand different information about weather and why do we construct shelters to protect ourselves. And they learn about um, some interesting phenomena within um, our, our country and take a look at actual places um, across their world, which is really interesting. Throughout this, you can see there's guidance for teachers on how the lessons play out and um, the alignment to our state standards as, as well as our English language proficient, proficiency standards or ELPS. And it's all based in these questions. Lessons are grouped together around common topics. 
And then throughout each module, there's an opportunity for students to engage in an engineering challenge or some sort of investigation. There's lots of investigations throughout, but then there is also this piece where they are doing a specific engineering challenge. Um, I'll give you a quick peek at one of those. Here's the logbook, sorry. If you can see here, um, students have logbooks that they could be printed out or they could, um, if they are using the platform that's available, these are actually PDFs that they can participate in that are fillable PDFs, similar to what we saw in the last presentation. And they're able to engage and draw. And this is of course a kinder, so it's an age appropriate content and they're learning more and more about weather as they go, including testing some different materials for how to um, interpret how windy it is outside in this particular lesson. Um, the engineering challenge, I think is, oh, this isn't, I'll try to get to that. Hold on one second. You can see that there's lots of details within each of the lessons. There are nice pictures that go alongside that are in the projected or handouts. The other thing that is um, evident in the teacher editions is that there's a lot of teacher notes to guide the teacher through the development of the content, but also some strong suggestions about um, particular vocabulary and terminology. And you can also see this highlight on knowledge and skills where they're pushing for the development of different stand, um, the different content knowledge standards as well as questioning that's happening. In addition to that, you can see there's differentiation guidance within there. I'm gonna to try to get to the engineering um, challenge, but basically students in this particular one were asked, this is a video, but they are looking to figure out how can we help archeologists feel cooler when they work? So they're learning about what are different materials and how can they insulate us from the weather? I'm not gonna show you this video, but it does take them through the whole engineering process, which is really exciting for students to engage in. So I'm gonna jump back out of here. I encourage you to explore. And if you have questions, please, um, please don't hesitate to ask us. Leslie or I are always uh, excited to talk more, um, but I wanna, value your time. And so we do have um, implementation support. So people are interested in using, there are module overviews and on the Texas Home Learning website, there is access to the different webinar recordings to help people understand and orient to the different components of the product. Um, Great Minds itself provides some additional trainings and has some sessions in which they've led to support teachers and leaders. And then there are internalization tools that we continue to develop from TEA to help people understand how to break down a module in a lesson and prepare for that. And then last, we are working with the ESCs to also support the use of the materials. Um, just one quick note, and then I wanna to get to all the questions that might be coming in. At, we are offering an opportunity through um, TEA to have people try out these materials with providing them with the actual um, printing costs and support with the materials themselves for recommended modules. So we are announcing this CRIMSI or the COVID Recovery Instructional Materials Initiative. It is basically a pilot that starts this spring and continues through next year for people who want to try it out and need support. It's both financially supporting and a lot of professional learning and coaching for how to teach science. As you can probably see, this is a very different approach to science that maybe people have not done before in elementary. And so having someone to support with the coaching is important. Um, just to let you know on this, there's free access to professional learning. Um, the print materials, the printed materials, and for the science, the, uh, there'll be actual science kits that go out. And there are stipends available for teachers who and leaders wanting to participate in this, including instructional coaches. 
all of the products that are listed here are actually um, available. So it's not just science. I'm just talking to this team about science, but it is other products as well. And the application is now open through the end of the month and available at Texas Home Learning on that site I gave you. Uh, I would really encourage any schools that you think could benefit from this to apply. Um, I feel like it would be really hard to be denied access to this pilot. And so they would get a lot of support in um, working with especially the science materials. Here's just a quick overview that um, the application is happening now. It's a really quick turnaround, but um, it's not that difficult to put. It's just looking for information. It could be a whole district. It could be one grade level. There's a lot of flexibility and um, my team is really willing to support in any way they can for what works for the district or school. I'm going to stop talking now and jump over to some questions because I can see some of them coming in. And please feel free to jump off and just ask me as well. Hey, Melissa, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got a concern, you know, with, with, with kiddos that are choosing to um, go to school virtually, being, a, being in front of, a, uh, being in front of a, a computer most of the time. Yeah. Um, does the THL uh, program, does it provide enough activities uh, for these kiddos to, to, to do, like as, as an experiment or in, in investigations, um, it kind of, you know, adheres to the uh, takes, you know, teachers are supposed to be doing, you know, so many percent of lab activities, investigations. How does this fit into uh, two of that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Billy. It actually does provide some like alternative investigations or recommendations for what could be used at home. We continue to work with them to like provide simpler and simpler materials. I will say like actually the materials used in this are pretty simple and many things that can be used at home. And so, for example, the one I was talking about with the wind experiment, I mean, it's like a tissue paper or anything you can find and kids are going on and it's encouraging students to try and practice. Nothing is going to replicate what's in the classroom, but it at least is pushing for students to do some investigations using what's available at home in an easy way. So I hope, I'm not gonna say it like 100% does it for everything, but there is that opportunity to really push that um, with the connection with the real world, like looking at materials that could be used with a hair dryer to see how the wind affects it and you can find the materials yourself kind of idea and pick those out. Okay. Good, thank you. Yeah, someone asked about the Spanish versions. So the videos come in Spanish as well. And um, so students are would be able to access most of the videos. Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we do have a lot. Um, they're continuing to come on as we go, but there are ways to even caption and um, for the video translations in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now it's just a toggle so you can go between English and Spanish videos. Yeah. So I was asking about how did you use it? Is it, is it for parents to help the kids? Is it for uh, kids that uh, doesn't speak any English at all? Or how do you use it? Not how you apply it. Oh, got it. Thank you. So I would say, um, you know, we have variations across the state with um, students, but we do have some schools that are like full bilingual schools where students are learning science in Spanish, and it could be used directly with um, students who are learning science in Spanish. It could be used to support students as they're developing their English language to reinforce the concepts by saying, hey, you can also watch this video in Spanish if that's your native language to still reinforce um, the development. So Larry, I think there's a lot of different ways it could be used, but that was the intention and parents as well. Are there any other questions for Melissa and Leslie? It looks like we got some great answers in the chat from Leslie while Melissa was presenting. We really appreciate that. Um, so Tiak, 
providers, the folks who are here at this meeting can go on that site, look at the Texas Home Learning, um, Yeah. Use if, it maybe. If you if you have questions, you want to know more about it. Um, Leslie and I are very much in the science world because we're helping to review the materials. Um, I'm excited about the approach and I think it just is uh, an amazing way to teach science and connect with kids to have them think and act like scientists. I hope you are too please um, reach out to us. Again, my name is Melissa Lautenschlager. You can email me directly or reach us at Texas Home Learning at TEA. Um, thank you for having us here today, Irene. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This was very valuable. We really appreciate it. Okay, Have thanks. Fun. Bye, Leslie. Bye, Melissa. Bye. 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 Thank you. So, this is, uh, oh, Melissa, I love your backdrop here. Um, <laughs> um, uh, this was, um, I think you as TIAC providers need to know about this. Number one, if you work with schools, you might want to, a lot of them may not know about this new tool you might want to look at some of these things and offer what you can, what you at your site or at your um, pro with your program can offer. Um, in addition to um, accentuate or help students learn these things, you might want to um, just take a look. This is the kind of, we hope, deep learning. Um, where students are learning inquiry right, right um, off the bat. Um, it uses some of our new scientific and engineering practices, which we'll talk about later. Um, I, you heard Melissa talk about phenomenon. Um, as an example, um, we, are, we have some new vocabulary um, and things that you already do that um, I think this will help kind of help you see some of this used in context on, on these lessons. If you'd like to, you know, go through the lessons yourself just to see how things are approached. Um, so you have, um, you have a whole variety of ways to use this um, yourselves. And I, I hope you will um, consider doing that. So we now have another spotlight. And Linda, are you here with us? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I work with the Bureau of Economic Geology and we are part of the University of Texas and the Jackson School of Geosciences and the oldest research division at the university uh, Founded, uh, we were started in 1909. Uh, the Bureau is also the State Geologic Survey for Texas. And today I'd like to share with you some of our educational resources that we've uh, developed more for the K through 12 audience. We'll go over, I'll just show you quickly because I know we're headed into lunch, publications that we offer, websites and some new video recordings. Uh, last year we presented to you uh, some of the offerings through our bureau store. That's analogous to like the USGS store. We are not for profit. This is uh, for printed materials. We sometimes get cost recovery on them, but we also offer a lot of things like free downloads. Uh, last year, Mark Blunt spoke to you about a booklet we have geared towards the general public called Great Places that you see here. But I'd encourage you to visit the bureau store uh, let me show you some of the things we offer. One that has been very popular with uh, 
informal educators and classroom educators are our uh, thematic map series. We have them available in digital format for free, and then we have them at very low cost for page size and poster size. So you may want to add that into your resources. We also have many guidebooks. Some of them, as you, if you work in parks, uh, you may have them in your stores that we work with you on. Uh, here you see some of them from Big Ben, Padre Island, uh, Longhorn Caverns, there are many more. That, uh, in addition, we also have a rock kit through our bureau store. This is new. This is something in, that we just uh, released last month and uh, we have a very talented artist that works with us, uh, Francine Mastrolangelo. Uh, and we wanted to develop something as a support to primarily middle school students. Uh, I am certified in uh, earth science in New York and a geologist. Uh, so I selected some of the topics that I know are required in the Texas Teaks and middle school. Uh, this is a reinforcement on beginning with the solar system, the Earth's layer, tectonic plates, the rock cycle, water cycle, topographic maps. And then we also drew from some of our other publications to focus in, we tried to make it place-based as much as possible, uh, Texas through time, where um, Texas geology and uh, the uh, geologic time scale. So uh, you'll see here in the this coloring book, we offer it free in PDF format, and then we have it for print at a low cost. Uh, Earth, the Earth's layer, we start with Texas and go through uh, the different layers of the Earth. Our version of the rock cycle came from a publication, Texas Through Time, where we placed it in a cross section. So you see the igneous rocks here, then um, both uh, intrusive and extrusive, you have uh, erosion tra and transportation deposition and sedimentary rocks. And then for the deeper heat and pressure, the metamorphic rocks. So we put that in context. Uh, Francine's drawings were tremendous to add to what makes geology I think special is this uh, understanding of uh, deep time. So we have the geologic time scale and different fun things for them to color. As far as Texas through time, one of the things we did is show, here you see 300 million years ago, there was a mountain chain running through Texas. And then when you get more to 100 million years ago, we're covered with the oceans that uh, deposited the limestones that we see across the state. And then in the more recent times, uh, 50 million years ago, 20,000 million years ago, you really see the development of rivers. So this is uh, something that helps students um, in a hopefully a, an engaging way to color. Websites. Uh, two years ago, we hosted a field trip to our new rock garden and it hadn't been completed. Uh, several of you have joined us. You may have seen some of the boulders that I'm showing in this uh, diagram, but the Stoneburner family rock garden is now open to the public at, at the Bureau and uh, there's also a website that goes with it and a tour along that's translated in 10 different languages. So that's something that I encourage you to look at. There's a great resources more for the middle and high school level. We also have a website and a radio program called Earth Date and that uh, has gone to, I believe, over 400 radio stations. You may hear this uh, similar to Stardate, where uh, it's what part of the effort to reach out. Um, the language that's used uh, with many of the National Science Foundation grants is uh, broader impacts uh, out to the public and really great resource. Uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about it later, but you can actually it's like a podcast series and radio show and you can download PDFs and use that as engagement pieces with your students. Now I would start off by saying I'm a boomer and a zoomer this year forces we have a wonderful program for uh, the Earth Science Week uh, and 
partner with collaborative partners in the Austin area. Many of them are in the room with us. Uh, for over 20 years, we had done a live event uh, at the Pickle Research Center. And this year we went virtual and our partners went with us. So one of the big goals in Earth Science Week is not only to um, tell the public, have them engage in earth science and develop good stewardship uh, understanding for the earth, but to have scientists communicate with the public. And we often have requests to have a scientist come to speak to a classroom. Well, we were able to develop this recording of scientists and some engineers, brief recordings that we posted uh, we developed a website around it. And also knowing that there was a, a challenge where many people were working virtually, hybrid classrooms, or asynchronous learning, we developed hands-on activities that our partners shared and posted those on our website. And let me just take you there. So you'll see uh, here is the, the website and we had 14 different presentations on different topics there. Um, let me go back. So you can also uh, go to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have a playlist that uh, will show these and that here's a link to that. Now, uh, I saw Margaret Baggio in the room. Let me just show you this. Is, we partnered with the Texas Space Grant Consortium, and this is their Zoomorama page. When you go to the detail, you'll see the link to the video. Um, Dr. Wallace Fowler is the main presenter, a professor of aerospace engineering, did a wonderful job. And uh, there are about 20, 25 minute presentations from the speakers. And then there's Selena Miller, who I think was in the room. And I know I saw you, Margaret, uh, also added these great hands-on activities. So we posted the video, the PDF of the presentation. And here's an example of uh, activity that Margaret shared that's posted on our Zoomorama website. Wonderful math and engineering science that the students could do on their own with- Linda, uh, it's a gray screen. Oh, it is? I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me stop sharing. I guess the PDF didn't go through. Yeah, that's all right. Let me get back. Pardon me. Okay. Now, are you seeing my secret life of groundwater? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, there's some Texas Water Development Board folks in the room. Uh, Shay Luther, Josh Sendahar. This is their, they came and spoke to us about groundwater resources. Uh, fossil record, we had a paleobotanist and uh, vertebrate paleontologist talking about prehistoric forests and their, their research and uh, in dinosaurs, how could you tell what color they were? So again, with classroom activities associated with it. So on demand, you can listen to those recordings and then go in. Switch Energy Alliance uh, provided a talk on wind energy. And again, here's a lot of engineering uh, energy ties. And I'd encourage you to go there. It's a platform that's fully developed with several videos and also quizzes that are available. If you go to the Zoomorama, you can get a special key to get into that program. Uh, it's very rich on topics of forms of energy, how do you use energy and challenges in energy. Uh, our own researchers in the Gulf Coast Carbon Capture Center. Uh, this one's hosted by several of our graduate students about carbon capture and the things that we can do to um, ameliorate the issues with climate change. And then Earth Date, which I mentioned earlier, uh, that in that place you can look at it and uh, Mark Blunt spoke to us about how to use it and we did some exercises with that. So 
something to explore. And I just wanted to keep it very brief, but if anybody has questions, please contact me. We hope to serve you. One of our missions is to uh, work in the realm of energy, the environment and economics, but we really want to serve society and I encourage you and really applaud the work that you do serving society. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And it looks like our new earth and space science course may be all earth science with the very little space, the space being covered in a separate, the separate astronomy course. And so there may be a new need for resources at the high school level. Um, you know, those cheeks have not been adopted and, and they'll be being discussed this month. So we'll, we'll wait and see what happens, but um, that may be a direction for now. So folks, even though we went 10 minutes over and that was entirely entirely on me. Um, I'm, I'm um, at, at 1230. Um, and if, um, so that we can start up and have our Houston Audubon Society um, spotlight before we're joined by Viviana Lopez, get, getting keeping us up to date on what we need to do around CPE credits that we give for educators. So if somebody will um, write that in our chat, 1230 return. If you would mute yourself and um, stop your video and Kiki. Before you go, before you go, if anybody's going to have to skip out this afternoon, I wanted to share this to start with. You know how we always put pluses and minuses up on the wall, wall before we leave? This time we're going to do uh, an electronic evaluation. If you want, a certificate for this time. You have to fill it out and email it to um, Irene. So I put it in a Google folder and I'm gonna share that in the chat now. Um, I will also share it again at the end of the afternoon, but just in case you have to skip out, grab that link because you're gonna need it. I understand if some people are having, needing another minute or two, but I think we need to get started right away. And so it's really a pleasure to invite the Houston Audubon to um, go ahead and take um, the screen, introduce yourself and, and um, share your screen, Marianne. All right, um, thank you, Irene and Kiki. It's always such a pleasure to um, participate in TIAC meetings every year and I enjoy listening to everybody and finding oh, what you're you doing. Oh, you have a friend. I do have a friend. This is Skeeter. Skeeter is a Mississippi kite. It's a cold day here in Houston, so she's probably wishing she was down in South America, but um, she's happily here at our Raptor Center and one of the many birds that we teach with. And different from a lot of the other um, folks who have been presenting, we're very low tech over here. We don't, we don't have a great IT department, but... Um, uh, so we do more hands-on and experience type um, programming, and I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. And just tell you a little bit about what we do here at Houston Audubon, and hopefully you guys can come and visit. Right um, Come and visit us sometime soon. Our Raptor Center is open with COVID restrictions. Um, you just have to call ahead and uh, make sure we don't have a, a class going on or anything. But um, we've been at our location here in Houston for 16 years, but we just officially opened the Raptor Center up in 2019. So it's fairly new. Um, but I've been with Houston Audubon for 21 years now doing um, as their education director. We're located in Southeast Houston. Our headquarters is on the west side of Houston and Houston Audubon actually has 17 different sanctuaries, about 3,500 acres of habitat on the upper Texas coast that we can serve and manage. 
Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with our High Island and Bolivar Flats sanctuaries. We have a great team of conservation um, folks who help us take care of our, our, um, our properties. Just this past fall in September, the brand new Houston Botanic Garden opened up and they are our next door neighbors. So oh. even though we are only an acre and a half, we are now situated next to a gorgeous 130 acre Botanic Garden that's just in its infancy. And we're excited to be partnering with them for programs. It's a beautiful piece of property. Um, and another reason to visit us down in Southeast Southeast Houston near Hobby Airport. Um, so this is where I'm broadcasting from today. This is our little log cabin um, at the Education Center in our front, gar front garden. Um, we sit along a historic meander of Sims Bayou. Um, it's a beautiful canoe trip around what is now a 60 acre island that's part of the Botanic Garden. Um, we are, my coworker Jeanette is part of the Texas Stream Team and she does mo uh, monitoring of the water in the bayou every month. And we um, engage eighth grade students at um, St. Christopher's Catholic School across the street from us to come over and learn all about monitoring, water monitoring in the state of Texas and monitoring their bayou, Sims Bayou. Um, this is a look down into our forest. Again, we're only an acre and a half, but we sit next door to a city park and the botanic garden. So we feels like you're in a much bigger <coughs> habitat than, than you really are. And of course we have lots of raptors. I think we're up to 14 now for folks to visit and to learn about um, as just regular visitors, self-guided tours. We have behind the scenes tours um, and other family community activities here at the center. Well, of course, we've been doing outreach for years and years and years in public and private schools, K through 12, uh, universities, libraries, hospitals, but COVID um, certainly changed all of that. We have a whole slew of programs. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but um, of course, heavily geared um, towards our mission of bird conservation. But um, our programs are also very diverse and we bring in um, not, not only natural history of birds themselves and conservation of habitats and birds, um, historical figures like John James Audubon, art, literacy, reading, writing, journaling, um, poetry. So our field trips, because we're a small site, um, our, our field trips tend to be all day events and just very diverse um, in what we offer, um, very interdisciplinary. We have continued to do our preschool program. We have one called Bird Buddies and another called Bayou Buddies and there it's a three year rotation so that if a child starts as a three year old, when they graduate from the program three years later, in Bird Buddies, they would have learned about 78 different birds or Bayou Buddies, 78 very distinct and different Texas animals. And these classes um, are every week, uh, September through May. It's um, a set of same kids every come every week. And it's a mix of direct instruction, music, science experiments, art, reading, outdoor exploration, dramatic play, games. And one of these days I hope to um, get it all published and into a curriculum to share with everybody, um, especially preschool, preschool teachers. We do have folks come out and visit small groups. So we get a lot of um, private schools that come out to visit um, when their students are uh, doing bird units. Um, we work with a variety of schools here in the Houston area. For educators, um, we offer Flying Wild. We couldn't do anything last year with Flying Wild, but we do have some dates already set for this um, spring for Flying Wild. I know, of course, many of you are familiar with Project Wild, thanks to all of Kiki's hard work and Flying Wild is just the bird version of that. So um, contact me if you're interested in joining me for Flying Wild. And these will be in person here at the Raptor Center. Um, and I know folks are chatting. Let me see if I can figure out how to, yay. Hi, Mark. <laughs> um, 
to the chat at the same time. Okay, so I'm excited to get Flying Wild back on our calendar. It's a, it's a great program, just like Project Wild, and we'll really get you going if you're interested in adding birds to your curriculum. Um, how much, there we go. Um, in terms of virtual programs, we actually began doing virtual programs about eight years ago um, with the donation of some um, equipment from life size and it was very cumbersome and there were all kinds of parts and cameras and things that went with it and it was quite a struggle but thanks to the great folks at region four they really helped us out in all those years figuring out how to connect to people all across uh, north america in particular um, and because we're small we're able to really tailor our programs and i i try to learn about the school that I'm going to be broadcasting to and show, I love geography, show them on a map where they're at, talk about the flyways of birds, what birds they would be seeing that are similar to ours or maybe the same. And um, it was just ironic that about three weeks before COVID hit, I had my first school ask me to use Zoom. And I was like, okay, I've never used Zoom before. And now of course we're Zooming into the future all the time. Um, doing, you know, of course, in, in the past when kids were in school and now um, lots of virtual and there's been certainly lots of bumps in the road figuring out that it's really important to be hardwired and not to use wi-fi microphones um, knowing that there's a, sometimes a time lag when you're waiting for kids to respond or you can't hear them um, but it's been a fun adventure and with birds it's great because we can talk about migration and how um, migratory birds really connect us across the hemisphere. And um, we use uh, CILC as our kind of marketplace. And um, just this past uh, spring and fall, we were able to give presentations and talk to kids about raptures from um, Thailand and Vietnam and South Africa and places in South America. And um, it's just really opened up the world um, for us to give programs, um, whether it's about migration, the history of uh, what science has learned about migration and all the great new science coming out thanks to technology and satellites and all that great stuff. We intermix our programs, not only sitting with the live birds and introducing the kids, um, you know, kind of in person live, but also with videos. Again, that was a challenge in the beginning, recording out in the in our enclosures and you couldn't hear, then I got microphones, but the microphones had wires and that was tricky. And now, you know, oh yeah, they make Bluetooth microphones. So we've learned lots of lessons in the last eight months um, and how we can um, really go along with the teacher and what she's looking at um, investigating in her classroom and help support um, what educators are doing, whether it's hands-on stuff like owl pellets or just going out and birding on their campus and learning how to use eBird and adding to that incredible worldwide database. Um, and we know that birds are such a great connection to the natural world. It doesn't matter if you're in an urban setting or out in um, a more rural setting. Birding has really become very popular during COVID along with gardening. Um, so we're here to help and support. We have a lot of opportunities for families to come and join us on our monthly bird surveys around the Houston area. Um, so in addition to our virtual programs, we try to offer experiences um, across the region so that folks can really, you know, get out there and see these birds in person um, and experience the natural wonders of our of our great state. We're all, of course, looking forward to being able to go back into um, classrooms and libraries and hospitals. But um, the whole Zoom format has really enabled us to uh, to continue reaching out, and we're looking forward to. Um, more virtual programs this spring. We, we got a wonderful grant from the Kinder Morgan Foundation to target uh, Title I schools right around our Raptor Center with programs. And of course, the, the grant was written for in-person, but we'll just transition that into, into virtual um, presentations. So if you're ever interested in teaching about birds and would like some more information or, or just to chat about some ideas, um, 
whether it's at your facility or you're an educator, please reach out and, um, and get in contact with us. And thanks Irene and Kiki for always a great, a great day with TIAC. Thank you so much, Marianne. Very inspiring. Very welcome. So um, let's see, is Viviana, are you in the room? Okay. Um, in, in that case. Um, I am here, Irene. Oh, hello. <laughs> How are hello. you? I'm so good. Welcome. <laughs> I, it's so nice. I was listening intently to Marianne's presentation, which was wonderful. And, uh, and uh, I forgot to, to check in with you. So here I am. Oh. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. We're just happy to have you here. And, you know, you're always welcome to come to our meeting from start to finish because it is pretty <laughs> fascinating. Um, yeah. So Viviana, if you would um, just speak for a minute or two about what you're up to before you s share your screen with your one pager for folks. Okay, sure. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay, to that we're in having to be in, in this situation, not being able to be face to face, but uh, it's always join, uh, nice to join this group and, um, and be able to see some, some happy faces out there that I can't see everybody, but um, so glad that y'all could, could be part of this. Uh, I was pleased that Irene asked me to come back. Um, uh, you know, in, in our world, in the certification area and the educator preparation area, uh, we've had lots of challenges as you can imagine. Um, you know, as, as everyone else has actually, um, I'm, I've been having to kind of um, uh, add a few additional projects to my, to my work uh, to be able to assist uh, our educator preparation program and our certification program. Uh, but it's been fun and I'm very pleased that I'm able to assist and continue working. Uh, some of us are lucky that can work from home, which has been a great additional thing for us. Uh, but, you know, overall, looking forward to a better year, year coming up uh, with uh, not only our, um, you know, health situation, but obviously our political situation as well. Uh, so looking forward to, to, to a better, to a better day. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can share my screen. I, I, I asked um, Irene um, and Kiki to send you guys the, um, the one page that I had created. Uh, but rather than, and you can have that available for your notes and all that, but um, I'm gonna see if I can share actually a short presentation I have here uh, in my, uh, somewhere in my, uh, here it is. So if you can see that, I'm gonna put it in um, video format. So you, I mean, uh, let's see if I can find that. I think you just want to go to under um, slideshow. Go yeah, to. Yeah, I am not able to see that right now. That's so why I was going somewhere else. But up, up to the top to slideshow uh -huh. and say from the beginning. Yeah, I, I, just, I just don't see that link here. Hold on. It's right next to the. It's like file home insert draw design. Then there's okay. Um, I'm sorry. It's hidden by your screen sharing permission. So there's an icon at the bottom that looks like. No, at the at the top it says file, home, insert. Click only on. Okay, home. Sorry. Slideshow. Go back and click on slideshow. Yeah. Well, over here. Well, I'm putting my arrow there. Um, slideshow. You just went over it not animations there from the beginning. Got it. Thank you so much, appreciate your help. Okay, so um, this is just something that, that I can ask uh, Irene to send to you guys later, but uh, I just modified it slightly from our presentation last year. And just as a reminder that um, as CPE providers, uh, what you are assisting us with is the fact that you are helping our educators that hold uh, standard certificates 
um, you know, educators, meaning both teachers and administrators, uh, holding a cert certificate to be able to renew their certificate every five years. So you're giving them the opportunity to earn those CPE hours um, for, for the renewal. Um, and of course, you know, it is about modeling the philosophy of lifelong learning, which, you know, all, all of us that are educators appreciate very much, being able to always be current and be learning new things that we can implement and make an impact on our students. And also the fact that the professional development is valued by their district and their campus. And uh, one of the things that I always like to remind you guys is that um, as a CPE provider um, by the state of Texas, um, you are obviously um, approved and identified as a provider on our list, but districts really can uh, also approve you for something that they want you to present. So you don't always have to go through us as TA to be an approved provider because districts have that authority to say, yes, you know, if you meet the guidelines and the requirements that we have at our district, you can always present without having to go through this process. So a provider is someone that is approved uh, by either us or a district or a charter to provide these continuing professional education CPE hours for our, for our educators. Uh, and also we need to ensure that when you're approved, uh, you comply with uh, all the provisions that are outlined in our uh, TAC, Texas Administrative Code, Chapter 232. Uh, that whole chapter has information for educators and also for um, the providers. So there are some entities, and some of you, uh, if you're engaged with, for example, a professional education membership association, uh, this would apply to you as well. So there, all of these are listed right here, and I added that on that one page that I provided as well. All of these entities are pre-approved by uh, Texas Administrative Code. So there's nothing that these entities have to do. Um, we ask that professional organizations, though, do provide us their information because uh, we want to be able to list them on our approved CPE list. Uh, that broader professional education membership association doesn't have a, 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 a way for us to be able to recommend them or, or you know, or um, uh, provide information to our educators. All the other ones are entities that are already in some kind of list somewhere, <laughs> you know, like all of our uh, institutions of higher ed, you know, you can go to their website and find that. Uh, so we ask that the professional education membership associations register with us only to, pro to um, for us to list them on our approved CP provider list. These folks though, and then this may apply to some of you then, are not pre-approved. And so they do have to go through us uh, uh, again, um, by um, applying, we have an application on our website, the CP website. This will apply to private companies, private entities, or individuals. We have lots of ed educators that are retired, or perhaps they have gone into their own line of work, uh, you know, and they do professional development. And so we ask that they go through the whole uh, application process. Uh, since I've been on board with, um, with the CPE division, uh, I have done a lot to streamline the process. Uh, you know, we used to have a little bit more of um, uh, monitoring, if you will, and, and had a more extensive application process. But we have realized that through, with time and, and through lots of additional information that we provide on our website, we are able to streamline not only the application process, but then the requirements after that once you are an approved provider. Uh, we are able to now, in fact, um, uh, uh, accept applications ongoing. We used to have uh, a time, you know, that it would be only a couple months a year that we would do it. Uh, I approve applications on an ongoing basis. And once approved, the provider can immediately begin to uh, provide CPE hours for educators. Uh, we have now a new change uh, from last year. Uh, now, our application process and all the communication goes through our help desk. 
uh, is under the CPE area, CPE for providers. Uh, I am the only one that oversees that box and uh, that is my main concentration in my work. Uh, so I'm able to get back to people within a day. Uh, and now in fact, our application process has gotten a lot faster because of that system. I'm able to get information quicker. If I have questions, I'm able to, to get back to folks quicker. So we have been able to now do this in a very, very effective way. Now, very briefly on the application, uh, also I have streamlined it from like last year. Now it is a, a, a shorter application and uh, um, it provides the specific information that is required, such as uh, what, what uh, uh, assurances uh, of the commitment that you're going to uphold, everything that we ask you to provide to the uh, individuals, to the educators. And we ask that the application uh, has um, alignment to our educator standards, or maybe to um, uh, text, or maybe to the uh, principal and the teacher evaluation process. So again, as an applicant, you may not have a connection to everything here that is listed. However, we would hope that there's connection to something here. Otherwise it would not be necessarily an educational opportunity. Uh, and then we ask that we provide a resume or a Vita uh, and that you list additional activities that you are going to provide and that you provide us the evaluation form that you are going to use during your, your presentation, either online or face-to-face -face once we get back to that type of format, uh, so that we know that you are utilizing the feedback from your um, um, participants to upgrade uh, and update your professional development. That's very important. And that's written in Texas Administrative Code. So we wanna make sure that you are evaluating your work. Um, once you, we review, we screen the application. We, uh, I get back with folks uh, to get additional information if needed. And now I can happily say that uh, it used to be that we had a four to six week uh, period of processing. We're being able to uh, do this within one week and or, or two weeks. And actually I've been pretty, pretty lucky to be able to do it weekly nowadays. So I'm real pleased with that uh, adjustment to our workload. Once you are approved, you receive a notification from us uh, with um, a six digit provider number that is assigned to your entity, either uh, the organization or, or the individual that is applying for a provider status. Uh, and once you receive that, you're able to immediately start um, uh, providing uh, the professional development for educators. Um, and we ask that um, if you have updates in your logistical information that uh, we can post, that we need to post on our website, then that you ensure that you are giving us the updated logistical information on an ongoing basis. Um, the requirements for providers, once you're an approved provider and you begin that process, is that you have to ensure that our educators receive some kind of documentation. Um, you know, we've always said it can be a hard copy or it can be an electronic way that you uh, demonstrate to them, yes, you completed this particular um, um, professional development. Uh, it should include the name of the entity that provided, it, the provider number, uh, the name of the educator, when this happened, the date of the activity, what was briefly the content of the activity, uh, the title many times suffices, um, but sometimes if the title is something that is uh, kind of like a uh, get you to come and attend the, the session, it may not tell us enough about what the content was. So we always ask, give us a brief description. And then of course, the number of hours that you are awarding to that educator. We ask that you retain uh, for at least seven years uh, this information the list of um, participants I completed, the date of the activities that you offered, uh, the content and the number of hours for the sessions that you attended, that you provided rather. This is really important uh, and that's why we asked for an evaluation form to, to happen. Uh, we expect our providers to constantly be in doing, you know, a self-study of their work 
to make to ensuring that they are meeting the needs and the priorities of our educators. And so we um, ask you to also have that in hand and retain that evidence for a minimum of seven years. I'm gonna pause right now just to uh, ask, to, to, to mention that at one point, and some of you that have been uh, providers in the past may remember, we used to have a requirement of an annual submission, kind of sort of like a, a renewal uh, way of, to, to stay on that list. We no longer have that requirement. For one thing, we have grown so much. We have, I think by the end of this week or next, we may be at about a thousand providers. So uh, there's just, we just don't have the resources, number one, to, uh, to do this. And number two, we really count on the quality of our providers. Uh, we answer any complaints that we may receive from educators. And we feel that by doing that, we are ensuring that our providers are always staying on top of things and ensuring that they're providing the quality uh, that is expected for our educators. Um, so you will find that on our uh, TEA website, there's a uh, CPE um, web page that is connected. It's under the Texas Educators icon uh, then you have to go to the preparation and continuing education column and right underneath that you'll find the CPE. And again, that page also provides information for educators and for providers. So that way, um, when educators go to check on what are the requirements, they immediately can see the list of providers, approved providers that, that they can choose to do their, their uh, uh, professional development in. That's all I have, but I'm glad if you have any questions or anything that you wanna follow up with, um, I'm here. Thank you, Viviana. We do have some questions. Okay. Um, in, in the chat, um, one, just to confirm, if, if uh, folks make changes to their program, um, do they have to send an update? For example, if they add new workshop titles or something like that. No, what what we what we do uh, is that when you um, apply at the very beginning, we expect you to submit a sample of your presentation. Um, so you may do be doing you know right at the offset. You may be doing five different things. Well choose one of those and we will review and approve that particular one. We ask that if you already have some additional ones that lined up to list them uh, as part of your application. But let's say that a year from now or two years from now, as, as Irene just asked, if you are wanting to add any courses to your catalog, do you have to come back and reapply? No, we do not expect you to do that. We just expect you to continue to do the same high quality work. <coughs> Great. And and um, so I see a, a question. Um, <coughs> they're coming in faster now. Um, <coughs> I see one here, how often do you have to get approval? And so that would that would vary, yeah. right? Right, so you, you only get approved once. You only get approved once. <coughs> if you add okay. additional ones, you may add them without having to reapply. The only time that there may be a discrepancy in our situation would be if someone, an educator, um, submits a complaint to me saying, this entity did not provide the quality or did not give me a certificate, you know, any kind of issue that they complain about, I will reach back out to you and say, how can we get this fixed? If, uh, you know, the expectation obviously would be that you would get it fixed. <laughs> However, if that doesn't happen, then that's when the, when TA says to you, no, if you're not able to continue doing the quality of work, and uh, do all of the expectations and requirements that we have for our educators, then we, will, we are not able to sponsor you any longer. Okay, and we had another question about what needs okay. to be retained for seven years, but the answer came from one of our very um, quick people who checked the website in the chat. But we have a question here, 
I'm interested in what expectations are for the are required for the self evaluation. What kind of evidence would you like to see? Yeah, we the primarily the evidence that we would expect would be your um, evaluation uh, for each participant. That is the main thing that we look for. In other words, are you using that tool to uh, get feedback from your uh, uh, participants, and then. From there, we would expect, you know, if we have, again, it would be something like, it would, it would be some kind of complaint or something that we would need to check into. What we would expect you to have ready for us, if there is a complaint about you not, you know, upgrading or updating your, your, your uh, type of um, uh, professional development, we would expect you to have something that would say, we received feedback that stated that we did this and it was not, you know, quite what they expected. Then what would, we would want to see is what well, what did you do about it so we don't get in the middle of saying oh this is a template that you must have or or you must have these points covered we would just expect you to tell us how did you address something that didn't go perhaps quite as um, well as you had expected in other words if your evaluation feedback comes back saying this this was not what i expected what did you do about it uh, so that's basically what we ask you to retain for seven years. Uh, and, and actually, uh, you know, obviously we would expect you to get that taken care of immediately. The seven years has only to do with that is uh, what is expected of our state to retain documentation for seven years. So there's, that's the only magic about the seven years part. And one last question, just okay. to double check if you've, if you're offering something that is totally outside of your wheelhouse, what you applied for, are you still okay as a CPE provider? Yeah, definitely. Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I really want to emphasize one more point, Irene, um, just kind of the closing is that just remember that we, uh, we are as part of our Texas Administrative Code, we must uh, approve providers that are not on those pre-approved uh, uh, entities that I mentioned earlier. But always do remember that bottom line, we expect the districts to be the ones to determine whether you are allowed to come into their you know, district and do professional development. They are the ultimate approve, uh, uh, approval piece, if you will. Uh, so that means that you don't have to be approved by us. It also means that don't think that just because you are a TEA approved provider that that automatically will get you into a district. <laughs> because <laughs> again, it goes back to the district making that final determination. Well, Viviana, thank you so much for joining us again. We really appreciate this information. So important to be a you. TEA provider as well. Okay, well, sure. bye-bye. Glad to be here. Bye-bye, thank you. Um, folks, I am going to move right in to um, um, the, the new science teaks and engineering practices. So if it's all right, I'm going to share my screen and um, and get started in this. Can you see this new screen? open to presenter into presentation mode. All right, good. Um, actually, I wanted this to be right here. Okay. Um, again, to reiterate what I mentioned this morning, these science, scientific and engineering practices are replacing our scientific practices K through 12. So no matter what, what um, grade level of student you work with, um, these will be of interest to you. And furthermore, they've already been adopted. They were adopted when the high school courses, the biology, chemistry, physics, and IPC courses were adopted last month. There are two student expectations that are gonna be different in all cases um, as you go through the grades, and that's the tools and equipment 
of course, you'd need to change that out um, for biology and for physics um, and a mathematical um, operations that would take place. So let's go through. So these are very similar to our scientific practices. You know, students have to make observations. They have to um, um, develop hypotheses. They have to gather information. They have to analyze. They have to critique. All the things that you are used to, um, I think, including in your workshops are probably still there. But there are some things that are different and added. And one of them is phenomena. That word now is sprinkled throughout these processes. Um, districts, people you work with may not, they may welcome some idea from you about what kind of phenomena you have to, to share. Um, here, I'm going to share with you a phenomena. My favorite thing, of course. Um, so what do you see here? How are they different? Why are they crunchy? This, this is a phenomena. This is something that can be observed in nature that you can discuss and learn from. So we're using the term phenomena. I'll put my leaves back. We keep them in the leaf bowl so they're not all over our house when we bring them home. Um, another term that you're going to see is design solutions. So this word design is in there. Um, this, is, this is engineering. You're gonna design solutions to problems. Um, and you've already seen that in, again in Texas Home Learning mentioned, um, Melissa mentioned um, this. And some of you of course are already doing this. Models, the term models has been in our um, scientific practices, uh, scientific processes before, and but now it's get, getting even more usage in um, these, let's call them SEPs for short, scientific and engineering practices. In addition, there are engineering practices and they can include many of the things you see on this list um, and solutions to engineering pro um, problems. So we're talking about solutions now and evidence-based arguments. You know, when Colin was in here this morning talking about argumentation, students are starting to learn how to formally through, through our TIGs, um, talk with each other. So what are, what are evidence-based arguments that are respectful, that put forward data that can be used? This will be another, another thing that we'll be looking to get examples of. Also, for the first time, we're dealing with innovation. So what's new? What's on the cutting edge? And of course, I am, uh, my heart is so much with the natural world. You know, we, innovation is really more around the built world, um, but a very important concept. And then instead of science careers, it's going to be STEM careers. So let's, let's take a look in this next slide on what these science and engineering practices look like. So, by the way, I have, um, do, are you seeing my screen where I have all the, all of you lined up on the right blocking some of the language or are you just seeing my PowerPoint screen? Let me know if you need me to, to close this. I have- 
we see your whole screen. We see your PowerPoint. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. That's what I want you to see. Okay. So here is the first um, of our, um, the KSs. And here is um, a, a KSs knowledge and skill statement, as you know already. But you see the 40% is still in there. But one of the things, so the, the student is going to be asking questions, identifying problem, um, conducting um, planning and, and conducting safe classroom, laboratory and field to answer questions, explain phenomena, explain why the leaves are now crunchy. Um, they're gonna be explaining things. They're gonna be designing solutions. So this is all in the first knowledge and skill statement. So here in the student is expected to, and this is not the teacher. This is so important that we want the student to do this, ask questions, define problems based on observations. And then um, or information from text phenomena. And there it is again, models or investigations. Um, they're going to apply safe uh, scientific practices to plan and conduct those investigations and use engineering practices to design solutions to problems. I did not highlight anything here because th this is, um, is not pulling out, this is biology, by the way. We don't have first graders um, doing electrophoresis or anything like that. Um, but um, these student expectations uh, don't have a, a different kind of engineering focus to them. So let's go on to the next slide where you see here, develop and use models to represent phenomena, systems, processes, or solutions to engineering problems. So you can see that even though our scientific practices are there, that we really are adding pretty robust language around engineering for the first time. And these are these scientific and engineering practices are supposed to be um, used throughout the teaching of all the science concepts, the content. So um, again, you see these words like evidence-based arguments, um, advantages and limitations of models. That has been in the teaks before, but um, there's a greater emphasis on it. And then they have to evaluate experimental and engineering designs. Take a look at C. This is something that students now are need to know and be able to do. They need to engage respectfully in scientific argumentation using applied scientific explanations and empirical evidence. So again, this is something that is, is very much um, being pulled out. Here we have the mention of innovation. And up in the knowledge and skill statement, the student knows contributions of scientists and recognizes the importance of research and innovation on society. Um, so if those of you who have been around for a while and remember the old analyze, um, evaluate and critique scientific explanations, now see the addition of solutions in there. So this was a, a rather um, well talked about student expectation B 
at the board meeting because we have this new language that some people thought should not be in related to science, but, and some people thought very much should be cost benefit analysis, but here that there it is in there. Um, and contributions of diverse scientists. Um, um, and finally, that students should research and explore connections between grade level appropriate science concepts and STEM careers. So this is a, a fairly uh, comprehensive addition of, of these concepts. So now what I'd like to do, and Linda, if you, you are here, I, I want to ask each of you, look at this list. I'm gonna put you in breakouts for a moment. Pick out at least one of these terms that's now front and center in the new SEPs and share with the people in your group what you do right now in your program that addresses one of these eight SEPs or terms in the SEPs. Any question about that? I will mean not will not be in your breakout group. You will have just about five or six minutes. Please go around your group and each one of you, after having looked at this, committing this list to memory, or at least picking out one or two terms, we'll, we'll go into breakouts. Questions before we go? Okay, Linda? Okay, I have it set for six minutes with a 30 second warning. Fantastic, off ready? we go. Are y'all ready? Okay, let's see. Kiki, you're muted, I didn't hear. Yeah, I, well, it's fun to watch the participant list because the, the count goes down as everybody goes out into their little, into the breakout rooms. Yeah, I'm so glad you guys wanted to do, I haven't done this before, but they liked it. And this is a cool way to make it interactive. Let's yeah. see. So, um, I, I have to give it time. It takes time to work the list down. There's a few that haven't joined. Let me let's see again. There's actually 27 who haven't moved, who haven't to gone anywhere yet. Room seven. Two. I just pick a room when everyone throw them in there. Yeah, it's yeah. Weird. Some go right away and some have to be moved. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because there's so many. Yeah, I wish that, that two people could host on that and we could be doing it together, but it doesn't let you. Okay, Kiki, I think I missed some directions because I went into the breakout rooms, but nobody was in there but myself. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, some of it's kind of slow. Let me see, I'm assigning people now that got left behind. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Greg, you're muted. It seems brilliant and yet it's still not magic. Uh oh. And when they're in a room and not assigned, it won't let you keep them in that room. So some rooms are having a lot of people. Mm. Two, three. Oh, there's one person. There's two. One person by himself. Maybe that was Greg. <laughs> he was so lonely. Put some of these people with him. I can't. 
once they're in there, let me see. I'm going to move this person. Oh, okay. So the rest of you who are not yet in a breakout room, are you choosing not to go? Move to 16. Okay. Some people have been moved a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where they are. <laughs> well, at least we tried. They're nomadic. Right. Well, and it appears that the people who have not gone are all not sharing their screen and muted. So it could be that they stepped out of the room. Like out of their physical room <laughs> you know they've just stepped away from their computer and they'll come back and they'll go what happened everybody where gone. am i <laughs> right exactly <laughs> so in that case i will continue to share my video so when they come back to the room they'll at least see us <laughs> You cracked me up when you said there was a <clears throat> lame soundtrack going on while we put some funny music on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's see. Six. I have I have friends who have um, like uh, song lists or, or songs that they've labeled three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes or whatever. And they have them like, you know, in a in a in a place where that's how they do it you know that's how they time things online is that they'll they'll um put on the the their song and they just have it labeled ah oh. oh. <laughs> which is very clever and and perhaps if i played with with sound on my computer a little bit more um i would make myself some playlists oh i feel like this is like that shell game I keep moving people. <laughs> I think I may have moved some people more than once again. Room 10. So if, if you are still in the main room and um, and you wanted to go somewhere, um, unmute yourself and let us know. And then Linda can make sure to reassign you. Um, otherwise, we'll assume that you have stepped away from your computer for a minute and, and we just can't get you into the breakout room. Yeah, I see Shay. I know I moved Shay once already. Yeah, I, I think the people that are showing, the 21 people that are showing that have not gone into a breakout room <clears throat> are standing in the hall. Maybe, because I've, I've moved the same people a couple of times. Yeah. And they're not hollering, wait, what's going on? So, hey, Michelle. Do you want to go into a breakout room or are, is everybody coming back now? 13 oh. seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. People are coming back. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> Here they come. Yay. All the faces reappearing. It's good to see you guys back. We miss you. Oh, we all come back muted. Yes. So what I would like to um, in, invite you to do, um, um, just for a moment or so, is to, um, does anybody have anything they want to share from their group? Well, Irene, we found that phenomena seem to be something popular that we both found that we did, or that was common to both of our groups, more so than some of the other topics <clears throat> listed. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. And so it, it's okay. hard to miss phenomena. Yes. Yeah, so I was talking in my group about Wednesday and our evidence-based arguments in the outdoor garden at a school. 
we found something we didn't know what was, and one of the kids decided it was a cocoon and gave me their evidence. Another young man decided that it was actually where a tarantula li uh, lived because he could see something furry in there and gave me all of his evidence. Um, and then there were several who thought it might be a mud dauber's nest or some sort of wasp nest. And then when we went back into the classroom, we did a little research and still couldn't figure it out. We called it our mystery. And um, I went back to my guidebooks at work and figured out what type of um, silkworm it was. And they were, the cocoon was correct. It was a silkworm's cocoon. Um, and so I was able to share that information with them later. And um, they were able to come up with that on their own. What a thrilling kind of experience for the students. It was just a great mystery for a day. <laughs> yeah. Irene, I'll share. We talked about, because um, you know a lot of them, it's, it's a little bit difficult to uh, figure out. And so I, I threw out that we do models. So in our Angler Ed curriculum, we uh, have an adaptation from the Project Wild Activities. Instead of, oh dear, we have, oh fish, or go fish. And half of the people are uh, fish and half of the people are habitat and they're food, shelter, water, oxygen. And um, they, the fish swim over to get what they, so everybody holds up their sign and then they swim over to get what they need. And if they don't have it, then they become part of the habitat. And uh, we change the, uh, change the, the circumstances where there's no oxygen. So what would happen? Uh, some fishermen came along and didn't uh, practice ethical fishing and kept all the fish they could. Um, there's pollution in the habitat. How does that affect it? So that was an example of a model. Well, that, that sounds absolutely fascinating to adapt it to an activity. Anyone we, else? We didn't talk about this, but I think the career portion is really good because students don't really know about all the different kinds of careers there are in science and engineering. Um, I know for certain my grandson loves science, wants to be a scientist of some kind, but the, the range of science scientists that he knows about is very limited. Um. Irene, I wanted to share a little from our group and thank you, Sandra, for saying that because it led to kind of what we had talked about. Um, we talked about model and innovation and then phenomenon as being words that, um, you know, like liquid nitrogen, dry ice, that that's phenomenon, then um, that model is something that we use a lot in a lot of our programs. But we also came up with a couple of new words that we thought might be good, like collaboration um, that whole concept of teamwork and collaboration. And then we also talked a little bit about debate, but I love that, like, I got particularly jazzed because at the science mill, we use all of these words in our programs and all of these concepts and ideas and STEM careers is our main focus with introducing kids to innovation and understanding that innovation is improving something that already exists and having that entrepreneurial aspect to science is fantastic. And so I'm particularly excited about these, um, you know, these new steps. And, and, and I think that, yeah, this is really, really exciting stuff. Well, fantastic. But hey, folks, I see that Michelle Sedbury is with us. Hi, Michelle. And I am... I'm going to, um, because we, we stole Michelle out of another meeting for Teak's review and she will have to return. I'm going to ask, um, because of the way we're running here, um, if everybody is okay, if we let Michelle start now so she can get back into um, her task. So, um, Michelle, hi. Hey. Um, yeah, happy to go ahead and go. Um, here, let me start my timer because I do get excited about um, STEM. And so I will I will just keep talking. So <laughs> <laughs> my, my name is Michelle Sedbury. I'm the STEM coordinator here at the Texas Education Agency. 
Um, and I, my position was created two and a half years ago. Uh, and, and so we are that far along in the work. And I see many of you that are familiar. I see some state STEM um, people here and lots of people that I've worked with in the past. So hello to everyone. And I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, really three buckets today. Uh, the Texas landscape for STEM. Uh, I work in the college military um, prep division. And in our division, we are really looking at how are we preparing students for future careers. And so just what you guys were talking about, and this is so great that I'm, I'm following Irene's perfect, perfect agenda, Irene. Um, well, it was amazing you got that comment about <laughs> STEM careers and could just go for it. So. Right, yeah, it was great transition, so thank you all. Um, and so we're gonna look at the workforce data. So you kind of have that in your pocket and know um, what is driving this work. Um, also, what is our vision? Um, we had a six-year vision uh, when we began this work two and a half years ago. We are entering into really this third year of this vision, so I want to share that with you. Um, and then uh, uh, most of the time uh, will be about the, the tech system resources and opportunities. So part of my, my job, I get to develop resources, which is uh, great. And I listen to what the field needs. Uh, and then I develop a resource to help uh, make all of you, uh, your lives a little bit easier. And so uh, I will share what I've created so far. We have 25 uh, resources that I've developed that are completely free. They're posted and I'll show you where you can find those. So we'll go ahead and jump in here with uh, looking at a little bit of data and what is really driving this work and the reason um, I was hired. And so when we look at our, our map there to the right, this national map, this was created from the US uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. And these dark blue states are the fastest growing um, states with STEM uh, careers and opportunities uh, within the workforce. And you'll notice that we are one of the dark blues. Um, and so we are one of the states that has a quickly shifting workforce towards STEM careers and growing opportunities. Um, you'll see on the left, there is a um, statement from the Texas Workforce Commission that Texas is expected to have the second highest percentage of the nation's future STEM job opportunities. So this is, again, um, in line with this U.S. labor market uh, data. We are the second highest percentage. We have 22% um, of our jobs are leading towards um, the STEM areas uh, and, and our growth is at 22%. Uh, the only state that's beating us, I'm um, competitive, so I wanted to know this is California. Um, they are two percentage points more than us, uh, but we are really neck and neck in this data in our growth. Um, and so, really we had to start with where are we? Like what is being done in the STEM education space in K-12? So I began a listening tour where I went to every region in the state and held listening uh, sessions. I um, led groups with formal ed, K-12 um, administrators, teachers, counselors. Um, I also met with a business and industry that are in the STEM fields. And then I met with uh, parents of students and what they wanted to see in STEM programs. And through that experience, what I saw as an overwhelming um, trend is that STEM is very much in pockets across the state. There are STEM deserts. There are regions where there is little to no STEM education happening in the K-12 space. Um, when we looked at um, the districts that were offering K-12 STEM, it was oftentimes only for gifted and talented students or for students that scored a certain percentage on their state testing. 
So there was local determination of what would um, allow a student to engage in STEM education. And at the high school level, of course, we have our career technical education courses, our CTE courses commonly called, um, and those are elective courses. So again, not, not for all students, but for students who elect into those uh, programs. So what we found were um, our students who maybe wanted to go pure sciences in uh, their high school uh, careers, because maybe they wanted to be a biologist. They weren't, they weren't learning any STEM um, education pieces, those STEM fluency skills. Um, they were getting the academic part, but missing the technical part. Uh, so there was a big disconnect across the state. And when we looked at this, to create a STEM pipeline that is strong towards all STEM careers, we need to shift our focus to all students. And so what we have done here in the State Board of Education and the science team has done is critical because now we have shifted this to all students. We are now going to be offering this STEM thinking to K through 12 students in science, which is a core concept area, which means every student, no matter where they live, will be receiving um, this, this information and helping prepare them for STEM careers. So this is a very exciting time for Texas. Um, just to give you a little uh, bit of information about our wages in Texas for STEM, um, we have a unique situation in Texas where our middle skill STEM jobs, which are any job that is uh, requires an associate's degree or less, um, have very high wages and high opportunities in Texas. And that is not the case in all states. So this is a unique opportunity for our students. Um, more than 60% of middle skill STEM jobs in Texas require only six months or less of formal classroom training, which means that a high school um, could offer a course aligned to an industry-based certification, um, oftentimes in technology, uh, which they only need one or two certificates to be able to enter a career at very um, good wages. And so that uh, is a big selling point for our students, especially students who um, this is very easy to obtain for free in high school and then have life changing um, being able to really enter into a career with very high wages. In our STEM middle school jobs here in Texas, a medium wage would be 35,000 to 95,000. Um, and so of course with one certificate, you're, you're probably not gonna be making the $95,000 skill uh, range, uh, but the more certificates, the more education that a student um, obtains, the, the higher those wages. The demand for middle skill workers in STEM related to training continues to increase and the jobs remain vacant. And so when I looked at this data with the Texas Workforce Commission, I did a little digging to see what are the trends currently and what are our trends um, projection line. And in 2026, we're projected to have 1.9 million unfilled uh, STEM uh, positions here in Texas. And that number increases every single year. Just since I've been hired, that number has increased by over 200,000 positions. Um, and so this is definitely something that I'm seeing as I watch the data. And so building this strong pipeline is very important. Uh, potential earnings for STEM occupations are nearly double that of all other jobs in Texas. If a student goes through an associate's degree, and remember a middle skill STEM job is an associate's degree or less, if they earn an associate's degree in STEM, um, the median wage is 75,000 to 100,000 in a starting position. So this is greater than a non-STEM bachelor's and even a master's degree. And so again, huge potential in Texas for our students. 
And then when we look at the top growing areas right now in STEM in Texas, we are seeing computing, uh, the drivers of computing is big data, um, computer science and cybersecurity, um, engineering, and then also our advanced manufacturing fields, which include uh, heavy engineering design process, and then also robotics, knowledge of coding those robotics um, and machines. So what do we do with this information? That is our background. So what now are we thinking in Texas that we need to do to prepare our students? So the first thing was we, we have to define, define STEM. Um, we are the, one of the only states in uh, the nation that did not have a definition for STEM that they were using across the board in all programs. And so our de definition that's been established is that um, STEM education is a method of hands-on teaching and learning where students learn to apply academic content by creatively solving real-world problems with innovative design-based thinking to prepare students for future career opportunities. And so this definition has been um, incorporated in our program, but also in our ecosystem that I'll talk about in a moment where our higher ed partners are adopting this definition, our nonprofits, our museums, our zoos, our all of these programs across the state have embraced this definition are, and are starting to think about this as they write curriculum and supporting resources for districts. We also looked at what are the trends um, across other states of how they've defined what STEM is and what STEM is not. And this is really important to understand as you are looking at your own programs and making sure that they are aligned to STEM education in Texas. So it is a way of thinking about your content. It's not adding something different um, or something that's just one more thing. It's about taking what you're currently teaching, the science teaks that we um, are currently adopting, thinking about that content and how you're going to deliver that content in an integrated approach. And so how do you take um, learning about river erosion and make that a STEM project? How do you incorporate that problem and solution thinking into that content? And so an idea would be, you know, we have a, a portion of the river that is eroding very quickly. This is our problem. How could we um, design a solution to this problem? So students learn everything. Um, they take everything they've learned about the soil, saturation, um, and they devise an approach to uh, slowing down or stopping this erosion. And then they present their designs to their class, um, considering the cost benefits, very important. Design challenges have a budget. Students think through that budget um, and they, they have to adhere to not going over budget and, and those types of things. Um, so it's thinking about what you're already doing, but just changing the approach um, to having students really be critical thinkers and problem solvers. So again, looking at these problems um, and addressing it seamlessly. So it's not like um, something separate, you know, um, teacher led instruction for a whole part and then stop and have students do um, a project. It's all embedded, it's more student led and they are involved in this process the whole time. So it's really this whole way of thinking about your content and then embedding those STEM fluency skills, which I'll talk about more in a moment. But these skills are um, looking at uh, what skills are transferable to other fields and careers other than um, just our STEM careers, but also non-STEM, like communication skills, being creative, um, collaborating with a team, those types of, of skills. STEM education is not a course or a program. So offering a um, quote unquote STEM course doesn't make your school a STEM school. It's really about um, thinking about the content in each class and how it can be adapted. 
it's not about turning all students into engineers. We don't need every student to be an engineer. Uh, what we need is our students to be problem solvers and thinkers. Um, being able to adapt to our new uh, landscape of work and our new STEM careers that are surfacing every day. And definitely in 10 years from now, we will have many careers that we don't even know of right now. Um, our students need to be adaptable and problem solvers. It's not just a buzzword and it's not short term and um, going to go away. STEM is here to stay. Um, our innovation that's needed from students um, in their future is uh, not something that will change. This is, will only increase. So when we went around Texas, we asked Texans, what do you want in a STEM program? What would be the pillars of a STEM program? We had over 4,000 um, responses in participation from all of our stakeholder groups. And um, this is in the order of how um, responses came out. So this was open-ended. We did not lead in any way, but these were the five top trending um, topics that came across. And the number one thing Texas wants is an integrated approach. So we heard very strongly that this cannot just be a science, math, technology, engineering, uh, approach. This needs to be something that our reading teachers have a part of. When they read a story and get to a problem, having them stop and use this design thinking in order to solve a problem that's in a story and then go back to see how the author solved that problem. Um, being able to incorporate your social studies teachers to look at the history of maybe um, the land or historically how something has been solved in thinking out of the box um, to solve that problem. And of course, in science and math, um, it's a little bit easier fit sometimes, but um, we heard overwhelmingly that everyone wanted to be a part of this solution in STEM education in Texas. Um, and this also includes those technical skills, the STEM skills, the engineering design process, the computational thinking, all of those process and technical skills um, are, have to be paired with content. When we look at alignment, that was the second thing brought up, not only horizontal alignment and cross-curricular opportunities between subjects, but also vertical alignment from pre-K to 20, uh, which is our college level courses. Um, if a student's making a bridge in second grade, we don't want them to also make a bridge in fourth grade, in fifth grade, in seventh grade. Um, and so making sure that strategically as a district, they are thinking about varied um, experiences. And this is where your programming can really help our um, educators that are in the classroom and they have a curriculum that they're not sure where to plug these opportunities into. Um, having the informal educators uh, be available with supplemental things that they can do um, will really help with this vertical alignment. And I'll show you um, some ideas of that in a minute. Um, the third thing was equity that came up, not only in gender and race, which we hear a lot about in STEM, but also in ability level. We heard a strong voice from our parents um, that it's they want all students to be able to learn um, these skills that not only make their students more prepared for STEM careers, but just for life. Being problem solvers um, in, is a life skill. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that not only um, our top performing students are, are getting these opportunities, but our special ed students, our regular ed students, our English language learners, um, those were four strong groups that were brought out consistently that they wanted this to be for all, truly for all students, and not just students that could stay after school in a STEM uh, club, in the day embedded so that everyone had an equal opportunity. Um, the skills that were brought out, we again had over 4,000 responses of what skills uh, people felt were important. There were nine that came very strong from industry and from educators 
um, and also our higher ed folks as well. Uh, we had communication, creativity, critical thinking and collaboration, which are um, widely known as the four C's. Those came out as a critical. Um, then we had resilience come up, having students learn to fail forward. Um, and then our business industry um, and workforce uh, strongly uh, needed promptness, adaptability, and time management, which are also um, very easy to fit into a STEM uh, lesson. And so these are the Texas identified STEM fluency skills that we are promoting. And then the last thing that came up was the method. The most um, popular method was problem-based learning or uh, project-based learning. Um, this is not the only way that you can uh, incorporate STEM into a program. It was the most popular across the state, but engineering design challenges are equally valuable. Um, th there are lots of STEM experiences that can be used, but this is the data that um, we received. So looking at your continuum of how to build these skills across grade levels in pre-K through eight, we're really looking at learning STEM integrated into content. And so as we learn content, the TEKS, this is where you would build in these skills. Um, these are the skills identified that must become habits by our students before they enter high school. So we are assuming after every single year um, that these would be habits and would not have to be taught in high school. In high school and college, we then transition to um, not learning these skills, but applying these skills in a work situation. So this would be taking complete ownership of problems and projects, coming up with their own projects, researching, and then work placement, going into a STEM research, um, uh, like apprenticeship or internship, something like that. So looking at our um, STEM, program for Texas, we have a framework of um, the six pillars that um, are present in all strong programming that we researched. The first pillar was equity. The second is school climate and culture, building um, your content knowledge among your teachers, around your staff, making sure that um, everyone understands. Uh, what STEM education is, how to do it, and how um, to build resilience in students. The next piece, the domain three, was your program design, making sure that you have looked at careers in your area and backward map the skills that are needed and address those in um, your grade levels all the way through a PK um, through career uh, pathway, learning pathway. When we look at uh, the next one, domain four is your curriculum, uh, which many of you will be able to contribute to. Uh, domain five is stakeholder engagement. So looking not only within the walls of a classroom, but you must incorporate out of school programming as well. Those experiences, going on field trips, having virtual field trips, letting students um, go out and job shadow. If they're interested, at, if the seventh graders interested in uh, working at a zoo, having an opportunity for them to go to a zoo and see what it's like at a zoo. Um, and so those are experiences that cannot be duplicated in a classroom. The students need to be out in the field to um, have those experiences. And uh, this group definitely understands the value of this stakeholder engagement piece. And then the last domain is about communicating um, your program, STEM programming with families, with your students um, and with the community. And so a way for you to get involved is with your um, STEM ecosystem. So we are a part of an ecosystem here in Texas, we are a member of the National Ecosystem. 
Um, our Texas ecosystem looks, our logo looks like this and our title. So when you see that, you'll know um, what, what people are talking about. We have 20 STEM hubs in Texas and they are located at each service center and each service center has a STEM lead. And so in each of these locations across the state, they are represented. So no matter where you're located in Texas, um, you can reach out to your service center to that STEM lead and get plugged into local STEM programming. Um, our goal as an ecosystem is to connect in and out of school to post-secondary and STEM careers. So this is involving all stakeholders. So each service center STEM hub is required to have these stakeholders present on their design teams. So all 20 ESCs have a design team. Um, if you would like to be involved, they are always looking for nonprofits, informal STEM educators, um, STEM experts from different um, organizations, like maybe a museum or something like that. Um, they need those those stakeholders. So if you're interested in that, reach out to your ecosystem for um, how to get plugged in. On the STEM TEA website, you can go and type in STEM in the search bar. That's the easiest way to find things on the TEA website It's the search bar. So type STEM in and that'll take you to the STEM webpage. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see Texas ecosystem and you can click there. And that will give you the, the name of all the leads across uh, the state. And so if you are in, um, I'm sorry, if uh, the Houston area, that's region four, um, and this, these would be your contacts. If you're not sure what region you are on the web page, there's a map with all the numbers. And so you can just look at that map and find uh, your number. And then our STEM toolkit is also located on the STEM webpage. Down at the bottom, you will find that there are three buckets of tools. There are planning tools. This is if you are developing a STEM program at your um, organization, you can use these tools to help um, align your program to the STEM framework. There's also implementation tools um, and then there are STEM uh, community tools. So I'm going to break these down for you real quick. The planning tools, uh, one, the, the planning tools most used by our informal educators are the STEM needs assessment and then also the planning guide. And of course, the, the pieces that do not apply to your program, you would just um, delete and not use. You can adapt these very easily. The implementation tools are um, for facilitators. So um, not only classroom teachers, but if you um, facilitate outreach at your organization, these are tools that you could use. Um, there are three buckets of these tools, the instructional tools. So if you are um, actually leading the um, uh, project or lesson, you these tools will guide you in that. There's the STEM reflection tools. So this is if you're new to STEM learning, um, after you do a STEM lesson, some reflective questions and things to think about in, uh, before delivering your next STEM uh, lesson. So just being reflective. And then that last bucket are the STEM culture and climate tools. So these are going to be surveys um, to see where your organization is and they're thinking about STEM. And then also uh, STEM fluency rubrics. So you can look at the skills, how to build those skills um, from a beginning level to a more advanced level. And then the last one are the community tools. And these tools um, are broken down. There are four right now. We have one that is this um, STEM family companion guide, and that will be released very soon. It's in the final stages of approval. Uh, but it is a, a book, a little pamphlet book. Uh, it's very pretty um, to communicate to families in simple language what STEM is and what opportunities there are for their children in STEM and STEM careers. So that will be added to this very, uh, very soon. Um, in, 
I know we're, I have about one minute left, so uh, I'll go through this quickly, but for your STEM continuum, this is under that bucket. Now, I wanted to show you this because this is an area you can immediately get plugged into and communicate this as a, um, a communication tool with your STEM lead at the service center. Uh, the way this tool is broken down is um, to help with vertical alignment for a district. So if I am a, a campus administrator and I'm looking to start my program in um, early education and build it through high school, but I have no idea where to start with that experience, this is an idea board for you to pick from. So this would be my formal educators, what they might pick from, then some ideas of where they might look at informal education that is local. So if you have a program, I'm gonna pick on Kiki because I see that she's here. Um, so maybe your districts are really not using your growing up wild material and you know that maybe they just don't know about it. And so you reach out to your service center and say, hey, I wanted you to know that we have an early childhood curriculum growing up while pre-K through two, I wanted to make sure that we're included on your informal education resources for districts. So then they, as they are, are making this document more local um, designed, they can add your program in there. So I tell people I try not to use things twice because I wanted to give as many ideas as possible, but obviously a STEM speaker could be used in every grade all the way up. So know that all of these things are interchangeable and adaptable for a program. Um, some other things you might find interesting, the family engagement tools. There's ideas uh, for a district of how to include family engagement. There might be ideas you wanna share that you promote as an organization that you could um, let your service center know about, and then they can send that out in their STEM newsletter. There are ecosystem ideas. So maybe you are from a program, informal educator or a higher ed program, and you want to get involved, but you're really not sure what to do. There is a whole document broken down into stakeholder groups to give you ideas of things that schools are looking for that you may be able to provide and just haven't thought of it uh, before. Um, so that that wraps up my, my talk. I think I'm like one, one or two minutes over, so I apologize. Um, but I would love to um, get connected with you if you have questions or if you wanna just reach out and, and, and have me as a thought partner and you wanna run something by me, Happy to set up a meeting to do that. Michelle, that was an awesome presentation. Really inspiring. And I think you will get some folks who want to, to partner with you. Um, I, I have gotten questions. Um, may we PowerPoint? Or is that something Lizzie. that... Yes, I can share this. And um, Irene, if you well, if you want to um, do your group time or um, break time, I can stay on for um, a few minutes and run through the chat and, and respond to those questions if we don't have time to do that live. Um, let's see. Um, I... I accept your generous offer. Thank you. So I think because it is it, um, a little after two, um, we are going to take a, a 10 minute break. I have 2.07. So let's all return at 2.17. And after we finish up with Michelle and this inspiring presentation, um, we are going to have three really awesome spotlights where I know you have many of you in evaluations over the years have said, this is where you get 
so many of your ideas. And, and actually the reason you come sometimes is to hear some of the spotlights from your peers. So um, let's come back at, um, at 117. Thank you, Michelle. Absolutely. is uh, states that had problems implementing said it was because they took a very siloed approach and they valued only the formal ed and it was not enough. And they found that once they broadened uh, their view of STEM education and really started thinking about um, learning outside of the traditional classroom, that's what made a difference and that that is kind of the idea was born to have this ecosystem and bring everybody together. So a lot of times it's communication. The formal ed just does not know what the informal world is doing. Um, and so the STEM leads, I've been training them for the last year about the importance. So they, they are going to really understand the value of of having informal educators support their work. Um, and they also uh, are needing to provide STEM education professional development. So the more you can tie your work to these engineering uh, practices that um, Irene was showing, the science and engineering practices, if you can highlight those pieces in, in your um, curriculum, uh, those are talking points also to help them see the alignment to uh, what they're doing at the service center. And so I could get that list by going to the DEA website under uh, engineering practices. Um, the TEKS list, I don't know if Irene is listening. Um, let, let me see. It was at one time posted, but it may have, it may be in a different location now. So let me. Um, okay, we, we can find them. We can find them. Yeah. Uh, let me um, ask you another question. Sure. And that is uh, for uh, a couple of three years, we had uh, veterinarians or different things, uh, different scientists uh, gave uh, a television a, a webcast and we we had as many as uh, 3,000 kids or whatever on a given time and then all of a sudden uh, a couple of years ago uh, we would get just 35 and so I didn't know because in your list was uh, uh, you know have a professional talking to uh, to the students about careers and about uh, opportunities and things and so I'm not sure exactly Oh, what well, what happened? I would like to restart that program if 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 we had an audience, and I was just wondering if you happen to know. Now, what we did w was we would uh, record that, and now the teachers have access to that recording, and maybe they just use those and don't want the live one now. I don't know. So we have a. It's called Texas Connections, and I will put that um, into the chat for you here in just a minute. And that is a Texas run website where folks like yourself can uh, put into that database that you would like to do um, talks for schools to be speakers and the topic that you um, are doing. And so it's kind of like a match.com situation. So the schools put in that they need, um, you know, programs on, on, a wildlife preserve, and then um, they will look through the system and see who has said they would like to offer talks on that, and then they match you up um, and to do those live presentations. So I will put that down here so you can um, put your information in there. They are always looking for speakers, so um, I know they would be happy to get your information. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Larry, they'll they'll get you in classrooms one-on-one uh, -on -one and uh, send you like inquiries of like third graders want this talk. Can you, do you know someone or can you do it? And we've done several of them. They're really great. So go for it. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Michelle. You bet. I'll start answering questions in the chat. Well, the, the break isn't over if, if um... Oh, if we, Michelle, can you yeah. explain how what you're doing is different than what the Texas Girls Collaborative Project is doing? And I know you know Trish Berry, Trisha Berry. Yeah. That would be a really good connection to, to let folks know what the Texas Girls Collaborative Project is. And, and as, a, as a female engineer, I'm, I'm a mentor for girls, but obviously we want the guys to go into STEM, STEM studies too. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it is a sister ecosystem. And so we are newer to the system. Trisha is a founder. So she was in on the first wave of cohorts. So cohort one, um, Trisha Berry started the Texas Girls, um, the Greater Austin Ecosystem. It is for Austin area. Um, and then we have another sister ecosystem, the Alamo Ecosystem is in San Antonio. Uh, they came on in cohort four, I believe. Um, this, the difference are those are more local where our ecosystem came in at the state level and it's, it's more um, structured in the formal setting. So the Alamo ecosystem and uh, the Greater Austin Greater Austin's um, hub is at a university. They have lots of business industry involvement, um, lots of informal, less formal. And the Alamo ecosystem is the same. And so the difference is just the way it is structured where we are statewide. We also have a representative at um, the Austin ESC and then also the San Antonio ESC. Um, and they work together. And so um, in the Austin area, it's Kim and she works very closely with Trisha. Um, so those ecosystems are kind of like a, a, a collaborative bubble in Austin and San Antonio, but everywhere else in the state does not have that. And so that's really key to um, not only getting Austin and San Antonio plugged into that formal ed, um, stream and getting them connected, uh, but it, it also has led to like super cells of ecosystem in Austin, San Antonio. And that's what our problem is in Houston. We have so many resources. We just, we haven't put them all together. We have so many amazing yeah. resources. It's, it's beyond and it's um, getting them to the people that need them is what our, our issue is. Absolutely. And that is the problem that was recognized loud and clear as I did the listening tour is there's all these people doing amazing things in STEM. It is very much in Texas, a grassroots effort and it's being led by nonprofits. Um, and so now it's time to get all of you guys, all these STEM champions connected to classroom teachers so that they know these programs exist. Um, and a lot of people are trying to recreate the will that has been created um, for decades in Texas. It's just no one knows about it. And so that's the power of the ecosystem is getting everyone connected. And just to let you guys know, this started in February. So it's pretty new. Um, we have had a lot of traction um, just since then with our, our ESCs, um, well, I guess now it's last February. Gosh, I can't believe it's January. Um, so we're we're about a year and a few months into the work. Um, in year one, they got themselves organized. And now in year two, they are reaching out and, and bringing all of these people together and they're starting to offer STEM PD. And so that is the big goal for this year is starting to um, pull all of these pieces together. Um, so this is where to Larry's point, this is, this is what they're doing right now is offering STEM PD and trying to find people to do it and then also find stuff for them to do it in their, their ESCs. Well, thank you, Michelle, thank you so much. Yeah. We are gonna move on to our next spotlight, but I'm so glad you possibly will answer some of the questions additionally. Sure, I'll do that right in now. In the chat. Thank you so much and, and um, thank you for coming to join us. So now we, we have 
Tracy, are you in the room? Tracy Bryant? I'm here. I'm here. Oh. Can you hear me? Okay, Brit Education. Yes. So Tracy Friday, not Tracy Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're ready to present, Tracy. <laughs> okay, you're off the hook. Don't worry. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I'll step down for a second, but uh... no, no, no. That we want you. Um, so, uh, um, just uh, before you put your slides up, okay. Um, yes. And share your screen. Mm -hmm. There you are. Okay. Yes. Her label on in the boxes is education. I'm sorry. I did not realize so, that. Sorry. No, that, that's good. Okay. All right. So can I share and my then you Irene froze up. I'm going to share my screen now. Does everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes. you're good. Yes. 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 <laughs> a technology success, yes, okay. I appreciate that. Well, I started out with, um, you're looking at our new brand. Uh, this has not been something we've presented from the educational standpoint. Yeah, on October 1st, 2020, uh, we merged with the uh, Fort Worth Botanic Garden and we are now the operating, we oversee and operate um, the garden. And we, the education programs, we've been working and working on uh, designing and creating programs for them for three years, but now we are one combined organization. And I'm really thrilled about the opportunities. I also want to say that, you know, there are some great thought partners on these screens. Um, I've enjoyed visiting with Amber Middlebrook and what she's doing. And of course, Michelle to help kind of build some things over the years. And we've been talking for a, a while and I wanna share some exciting things with you. The first one is uh, it's gonna happen next week. And this is a, wait a minute, let's see. Um, we are going to have a prescribed burn on the Brit Prairie and the stem behind a prescribed burn um, is uh, pretty fascinating. And we're coordinating this with the Fort Worth Fire Department. We are going to create, it works great. It um, does a great job working with our, fits in perfectly with our environmental STEM platform. So we're going to create programming for not only STEM um, for students, but there are people um, who own small lots of land. We're gonna burn six acres on Wednesday. Uh, Billy, I know I haven't called the zoo. I've let most of the cultural district know this is gonna happen, weather permitting. Um, and you know, people like uh, Lady Bird Johnson and some nature centers are gonna go, big deal, we burn all the time. This is going to be a burn in the heart of an urban setting. Uh, and this is, uh, a lot of people are very excited about it. We've worked a long time to make it happen. We've, re we've been rejected a few times, but we, we finally met the right person. It was the, the fire chief could make this happen Wonder, uh, before anyone else. And this is something that we'll be creating. We will be uh, videoing. We have, uh, we've worked with research to collect data on the plant surveys of the prairie pre and post burn. Uh, soil studies have been done and will be done pre and post burn. Um, um, temperature, different uh, other data has been collected. And from all this, our design team's ready to create some really great opportunities and connect STEM careers, the people that we're working with in interviews to talk about what ha what's, hap what's happening here and the different careers that can play a part in this. So we're really excited about that. So if you're in the Fort Worth area um, and you see smoke, uh, don't panic. Uh, and we've got that message. It will go out to the media the day before because we also uh, are, um, uh, we have, we're we tied to mother nature. Mother nature might not allow it. The winds, the uh, so we're gonna have to, it's a last minute thing if you understand a prescribed burn, but we're very excited about this opportunity and um, all the things that it's going to create for opportunities to share with our community. Um, 
our field trips, you know, we have been basing our programming on an e-STEM and environmental STEM program for the past five years. And our field trips now have gone virtual. Uh, it's a uh, virtual is tough for me, Zoom wears me out, but um, the virtual field trips have done well. You can go onto our website and um, schools and you can check out the possibilities. We are opening up the, the one here below leading the way is a STEM based, um, a, a heavily STEM based field trip on um, the lead platinum build, our lead platinum building and the components and careers of that very strong engineering design component there that we're very proud of. And that one is uh, ready to be released and ready to go at the end of January for schools. Uh, the others were, have been up and running for the fall. And um, so we've done, um, and we've had some success, but it's not like we know, we, it's not like having them out in nature, but we're all adapting to do the best we can to help these teachers and students um, stay connected. Um, our children and family programs have really taken off. Our Green Revolution, that is a, that is a leadership, environmental leadership program for middle school and high school. Students, we cannot, we're no longer having STEM University Saturdays here each month, but we're offering virtually Team Tuesdays. And it's basically based on Career Corner. It's a Career Corner and discussions with STEM based um, career folks that we have uh, relationships with. And it's going very well and we're excited. And this is not just for the Green Revolution members. This is open up to all students who are interested in learning more about STEM and STEM careers. We had gone virtual for our early childhood programs and uh, we are in March hoping to practice safe outdoor um, guidelines to bring back our Bella programs and our Carlos, our uh, Little Sprouts program in the garden with our backyard veggie garden. We are offering, um, we are also offering private story time with learning pods, homeschool learning pods that have been formed just recently and those have seemed to do very well. And we are, go we are gonna offer a, um, a family spring break camp experience on site, practicing of course, safety guidelines, uh, COVID guidelines. Um, we have created, this started out as a Girl Scout program, but then it's grown. And this is, we really call it our Girl Nature Workshops. And this is a partnership. And I love the word groovy and my, my team knows that, but um, a groovy partnership between, um, between the um, <clears throat> Fort Worth Garden Club and Brit Education. And we, this is this these meet on Saturdays monthly, once a month, and uh, we're seeing it's not it's gone beyond Girl Scouts and badges. Any young lady who's interested in nature and environmental STEM components uh, can attend this, and we're seeing uh, a lot of activity, and we're excited about where this could go. The pictures I took here were from the December workshop, and it was. Um, Zen in the garden. So they had some time in, our, in the Japanese garden. They worked, um, we kept them outside of the conservation, uh, the conservation greenhouse and allowed them to um, um, work outdoors and build their own Zen garden, take it home. Here's an example in that top left corner of a Zen garden that a young lady built. Uh, they had experiences in the in meditation and uh, a pruning and, and in the Japanese garden prior to that, it's a two hour workshop for these young ladies in the mornings. Um, and then, I don't know what it says. So our homeschool programs, I was having trouble because um, I wanted to pull in from the 2020, our photos. And we had some homeschool programs before COVID hit. And in one presentation, I, I pulled from the 2020 photo um, catalog, but I put something without mask. I put children without mask because in in February, you we weren't wearing masks last February and people went crazy on my presentation. So I, I'm limited on some of the things, but um, our homeschool days are, um, we do, 
Oh, we're at five a year. And we are also doing, uh, upon request of people asking, they want private homeschool days. They want to bring their own groups and not mingle with a larger group. And both have been successful. Um, we have a new exhibit. And because of our partnership or this new collaboration, the exhibits, like I said earlier, we're going to be doing more STEM challenges with the exhibits that we're bringing in. We're bringing in starting the artist Patrick Doherty, stick art. He will be here in February creating um, a masterpiece, a sculpture using, um, using plant material. And uh, we will create, we've created a program and it's going to be at this point, this is a pilot that's gonna be for Fort Worth ISD students to, uh, it's, a it's an engineering based challenge. We called it the STEM challenge of stick art. So we're really excited about what that's gonna uh, take place and that'll take place in later March. And, but our homeschool days are also going to have a chance to be part of this as well um, on, uh, on our March or April homeschool day. Uh, exhibits, we have partnered in from, let's see, the Fairchild Conservatory, uh, we brought in topiaries. And I know the Fort Worth Zoo has helped us with some information for signage. And we brought in some amazing topia animal topiaries that we partnered with the Fort Worth uh, Public Library to continue this, our literacy and our mayor's push for literacy. Um, and uh, we've done some story times and some virtual activities and a scavenger hunt based on these beautiful topiaries. This is, you know, I'm kind of a fan of the primate and this is, um, this is my favorite. Some would put the peacock just came out and uh, we're real excited about the, um, the families that have come out to enjoy this. And then um, if you see down below here in um, the right corner, that's one of Patrick Doherty's stick art sculptures. So these aren't little, these are huge that we don't want people climbing on them, but people can walk through and experience them. Uh, there's one up right now at the US Botanic Garden in DC and, um, and he has created them all over the world. So we're really excited about this possibility and the programming that some of the other exhibits throughout the next few years we're bringing in and how we build programming around them. Um, and I think I'm at, I want to ask any, answer any questions, but let me know, is there anything, anything you need to know? And I'm going to unshare, stop share. There's my presentation. I know we're running behind, so I kind of sped it up real quick. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, will folks use the chat to, oh. if they have any questions for Tracy and, um, we will move on right now. Um, Larry Joe and Matt Hendricks, are, are you both going to be presenting today from, uh, um, on the coastal Bay, Ben's Bay, bays and estuaries. And I'm going to let Matt take the lead. And if anyone has questions, I'm going to be monitoring the chat. So Matt will take the lead on presentation. Okay, Matt, hello. Yes. Hello. I'd give everybody like a high five, but the last time I tried to do that on a Zoom call, I broke my monitor. So we're not going to do that again. <laughs> I was just seeing who was listening. I mean, uh, I like seeing some of the faces like, wait, what? All right, no, so uh, yeah. So I'm with the uh, Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program. I will made a short little PowerPoint slide and I designed this to go kind of quick or longer. I mean, depending on the time, but since we're running a little behind, I'll make it go uh, a little faster. So let me share this. Yay, can everybody see it? Oh, beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, I shot that photo, I don't know, about a month and a half ago or so. Um, so we've got the sandhill cranes right now at our property. And if we if we go further in the property, right at about sundown, you'll see thousands of them flying overhead. So uh, yeah, this shot, I was trying to walk out from some trees and and the birds noticed me and they, they took off. So that's why there's some fuzzy green stuff on the side, on the right hand side of it. But um, I mean, I still got the shot, so I was pretty happy about that. But yeah, so this is a Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries program. 
So, and you might need to move the little floating bubble head, you know, around. Um, so then that way you can see all the text to it. But yeah, no Oasis Delta Preserve is what my, uh, my specific property is. It's over 11,000 acres of the estuary fed by the Nueces River um, and when we were located in Corpus Christi. Um, we also strive for Teeks Align discovery-based learning. Uh, right here inside this picture, you can see some whistling ducks helping other ducks discover their learning. I don't really have any other thing to say about the photo. I mean, but yeah, but those are, uh, those are some of the animals that we have out um, at the preserve. So um, during the, the virtual era that we have come across, then we have offered online resources to further our uh, virtual discovery-based learning tools because we tried to think how can we bring this still to people uh, to give them discovery-based learning. So um, the some of the videos that we posted, we posted these on our Facebook page. So um, I hope either Larry, Joe, or Kim can share that link. If not, I'll share them at the very end. So on our Facebook page, we, we decided to post quite a few more or quite a few videos um, or, or pictures or a little graphics trying to help people you know during this fun time to still get outside and still enjoy nature and this was actually a huge success um, and even today as I was talking to people about this and some of the breakout rooms they were like well this sounds awesome so it was a hundred inch hike and what you do is you take a string that's a hundred inches and about every 10 inches you you make notes you make drawings you you do whatever you can and, and it's made people discover um, animals and insects, especially in their own backyard that they didn't even know that they had. And this was something very easy to do for social distancing because you only needed 100 inches, uh, you know, to do this and you could do it kind of anywhere. Um, that's just one of the examples that we that we have. Um, also on our Facebook page, we did other videos for um, like nature journaling, how to set up a nature journal, how to set up a nature journaling spot which are also great ways to just kind of get out and away from people. And it's, uh, it's discovery based learning, you know, you're, you're learning everything as you go and, and it might make you ask questions like, I wonder what this bird is, or um, why is this bird doing this? Why, why are these flowers like this in my area? And it, it will help people kind of uh, further um, investigate, you know, their own, their own environment. So, and uh, the picture down there of the hummingbirds. So, there is a, not, I mean, the best way to say it, but there is a benefit to the lack of people at the Delta Preserve because the animals have really come back. I mean, they're always there, but when you have hundreds of kids or hundreds of people around the property, it's not like it's easy to see some of these animals. So we've also been sharing photos and everything of the animals that have been at the, at the Delta, you know, letting people know that, hey, the animals are still there. And the next time that they come out, uh, they'll be able to see them. In fact, uh, tomorrow, we have our, it's kind of our star party um, where we're not going to have telescopes set up for people uh, who want to come out and, and look up at the stars, but if they bring their own telescope or they have their own binoculars, which work great for viewing stars, if you've never done that, just go outside with your binoculars during the night, do not look at the sun with it. It's not the right stargazing you want to do, but uh, yeah, go out during the night and, and binoculars work really well for seeing things so we're gonna do that tomorrow night. So if any of you are in the Corpus Christi area, um, you can jump on the Facebook page and, and sign up for that. It's a pretty fun event. And last year we had over 200 people. Um, this year we, we won't have 200 people because you know, COVID and such, but, but it'll still be a fun event. Let's see. Uh, we also have started doing this uh, Teacher Tuesdays. Um, the photo right there is of a teacher Tuesday in February, because nobody's wearing masks. That was the old generation of TVs. Obviously that wasn't February of this year, but uh, Teacher Tuesdays, first and third Tuesdays of the month. Um, they, they're good for uh, um, allowing teachers two hours of, uh, of CPEs. And they're also uh, continued monthly um, teacher Delta engagements. Then we can still keep in touch with the with the teachers that we have that come out to the, the property. And sometimes it's not even people who come out to the property. On this last uh, Teacher Tuesday that we had, we had somebody from Canada. So that was kind of cool. So yeah, it's a great way for people to just jump on. And, and we, we partner with other organizations. Um, we have a uh, talk from the International Crane Foundation um, and uh, UTMSI's NER, um, the National Est Estuary Research Reserve. 
Yeah, I believe that's the acronym. Um, but yeah, so we, we partner with a bunch of different people. We've got, um, I believe, one coming up with the NERDL patrol. And if you're not familiar with NERDLs, then uh, look it up. Um, they're the tiny little plastic beads that you find on uh, beaches, sad, but they are what make plastics, um, everything that we use for plastics. So they're, they're kind of the raw form of them. So yeah, great way to keep in touch with teachers. Um, we also did this uh, once, actually just a couple months ago, um, Project Wild and Aquatic Wild Workshop. So what we did is we did this at the Fulton Learning Center. Um, it was outdoors. We were able to get some social distancing uh, in place and we were able to, it was um, kind of a hybrid system where we did part of it in person and part of it virtual. Um, and, and we used all the, the proper protocols and everything during this, this time. But the, the virtual part, we had a Padlet and, uh, and we allowed some of the teachers when they used some of the Project Wild or Aquatic Wild um, workshops, they were able to, um, to jump on this Padlet and say, hey, this is what we did and this is what we were able to, to accomplish. And so, and you can see right there in the middle, um, one of the teachers decided to do recycling water bottles um, thanks to the Plastic Voyages um, workshop and uh, and yeah and so they they had a nice trash bag full of plastic bottles after just a week so it was a great way to open up kids eyes to be like yeah this is this is what's happening so and then last uh, we've been doing a lot of these nature journaling um, and the three screen grabs that you have at the bottom of it those are all from ones that are on Facebook um, so you can jump on there it kind of tells you how to set up um, you know, a nature spot and maybe what to look for, different ways to interpret, different ways of coloring. You know, do you want to use colored pencils or just a regular pencil? Or, I mean, the opportunities are pretty vast with, uh, with nature journaling, which is awesome. And, uh, and it's designed for teachers and students. And it's also um, a way that we can host it at either our preserve uh, at schools or even in, in our own backyards. And we can do this virtually or in person. And the great thing about this is since it's outdoors, then doing in person and social distancing is pretty easy, especially when we have 11,000 acres to work with. So yeah, um, those are the things that we've been up to. And, and most of this stuff, um, if not all of it, is on our Facebook page. So, and I will stop sharing so that way I can go and check those comments to make sure that it was put up there. Do, do, do. Maybe. So Matt, I just put it in there again, but our website is listed twice. We don't have the Facebook up there. You have been complimented uh, a thousand times <laughs> over your amazing photography. So that's good. And one of the things that keeps coming up is Teacher Tuesdays. It is virtual. So you may want to explain how they can get to those links on our website and all of that fun stuff. Yeah, so yeah, and all of that stuff's either, I mean, we'll post it on our Facebook saying, hey, you know, click on this link, it takes you to our website, you sign up there, and then that's how you get the, the link for the Teacher Tuesdays. Um, it's, a, it's a great little, little thing that we've got going, and, um, and I've enjoyed seeing some of the teachers, especially, I mean, we just had the one from Canada, which was kind of cool. Um, and yeah, and Larry Joe Kim did put up the Facebook page again. Okay. So, and, yeah. that one, so. and then, let's see, did we get our email up on there anywhere? It's trying to make it quick so we can keep it to the on time ish. <laughs> if there are any other questions, I'm watching the chat. So y'all can either unmute yourself or um, put it in the chat. Oh, yep. There's a teacher workshop one that Kim just put up there. And Kim also works with us um, at, at the Delta. Oh, there we go. The education at cbdep.org. That's the that's the good old uh, email that you can use to contact us or or to if you have any questions or anything else. But again, a lot of the stuff that we just covered is also on our Facebook page. So uh, and and some of the photos and everything. So some of the ones that I shared on this are, are not online yet, but um, they will be soon. And uh, otherwise, we've even shared a lot of the photos and everything of the animals out at the preserve. So, yeah. Thanks, Matt. Th thank you both so much. Very exciting, very impressive work. Um, we're going to move on to our third spotlight for this for this afternoon period, and Larry, 
will you will you begin um, with your um, resources from Texas A and M? Okay, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. So I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to try to cut this a little shorter. Uh, okay, I don't know if. Can you uh, share, share? Okay. So um, basically uh, we, we have three things that we do. Uh, our website is vetmed.tamu.edu peer. Peer is our name. And basically uh, we interact with public schools uh, three ways. One, we develop curriculum, and that's kind of what I'm going to tell you about. We also have scientist visits uh, and professional development. We have online professional development that, uh, that we may have to start with. Uh, one of our curriculum is at One Health, which is really uh, human, animal, and the environment. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, Right now, I will we'll talk about the other types of curriculum development we have. We use veterinary medicine to stimulate kids' interest uh, in, in STEM uh, because uh, they, know, they uh, will learn the vital signs of the favorite animal, you know they will, and discover they got vital signs too. So we trick them into learning by things that they are interested in, and also that gives them a real world example of things. Like we have clinical trials, that's certainly good to know about with the vaccine going around, right? Animal research, diabetes, infectious disease, what about it? Uh, and like physical exam, where we get the physical exam, how is that part of the scientific method? So you can, how do you use, this, use the physical exam in terms of making a diagnosis? Uh, you make a hypothesis first and then test it to see. So we have lessons on those. We also have environmental uh, and biology lessons so we have the ecosystems, organ systems, the cells. And what these, we, this is a curriculum we developed some years ago, and now we're revamping them for teachers with uh, COVID uh, things that have to do at home. And so uh, we make PowerPoint slides out of things, Google slide presentations, uh, note-taking things, interactive pre and post tests, uh, Google forms, uh, study games, activities to reinforce things. And they're both in the TEKS and NGSS uh, two as standards of which they have, but you can see those. So uh, this is Dr. Clem's idea. Uh, the first thing a kid wants to know why I need to know this. So why does it matter? That kind of gives you the uh, application for why it's important to know things. How do we know? What do we know? And what are some of the hazards that may be associated with that? Like this one, the cell, cells are us. Uh, we talk about, do we have flashcards and organization of cells? Uh, and so there's games, there's interactive things. So teachers could download these and, uh, and, 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 and use these note-taking guides. So it tells them uh, what they should, uh, the main points they should be getting uh, from the presentation and it allows you to uh, take notes associated with that. Also, we have uh, famous scientists and a little bit about them whenever they were kids and how they became interested in science and also hazards of the world. Uh, what are some of the hazards? And it shows you uh, based on this, what, which one of our modules matches those. In addition to that, we have an integrated curriculum uh, that uh, integrates uh, uh, math, science, English, and social studies around a, a narrative story. So this is where kids travel in time and space. They go back to King Tut's tomb being built and someone's getting sick and they have to investigate it, use the math, use the science, use the English uh, to talk about that. So each one of those have it like half-life. Uh, okay, how do you get carbon in the plants? Okay, how do they get radioactive? So you will be able to determine the life, uh, the, the age of things that you might discover. Also, in addition to, this is for the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade for each one of those grade levels. And also there are standalone lessons that, that, that we have there. And this is in math. So this is a uh, circumference and different things. These are uh, things that you have in math. Also, we have them in English. So how to, uh, how to uh, uh, be a, 
write an informative essay, how to conduct an interview, how to write a, a business letter, how to do a summary. All these things are here. They may be useful for people who have uh, English as a second language or uh, uh, the writing uh, activities that, uh, that people need to, need to do. So each one of these, if you click on those, uh, you will be an example of how to write a business letter uh, that, that you have. And for a long time, we've had the teacher requested resources where the teacher made a request. So the teacher made a request and then we responded what that, the teacher made a request, uh, our undergraduates tried to answer it, our teachers, our faculty got together, we send out to other teachers and then they put it on a website. We have 643 of these lessons and activities that they have. And so you can search these by just punching in the word cell. Okay, here's chemistry links is one of those lessons. Uh, there's meiosis, mitosis, uh, cell bingo game uh, that's uh, in there. And sometimes we use our materials, uh, other material to be able to answer the questions that the teachers have. This one cell, we're still with cell and there's force and motion uh, that's uh, in, involved in through there. And there's atom, put you in the atom. How about the periodic table? What are some ways of, to make your own periodic table? Uh, uh, illustration, of course, you can't change the uh, atoms they're in, but you can uh, make an illustration of that. And then we have uh, the TEKS Align lesson. So we have this for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So we have uh, for each one of the standards, now they're going to be modified, of course, <laughs> soon, uh, but uh, always something to keep us busy. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we have something for each one of those standards that are there for the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Then I want to mention too that we have videos. So you can go to the videos on there and we have those. This is Animal Body Explained. What is a dog pant? What is a, a cat purr? Things like that that you could have. If you had uh, animals in the city, would you vaccinate for rabies? Well, absolutely, you would. Um, and then how-to activities we have, scientist presentations, video conferences, veterinary presentations, each one of those. And we have interviews that you have interviews, graduate students talking about them uh, discovering things and what they do in their laboratory. Scientist interviews, uh, different ones, and veterinary student interviews. So if we look at the uh, at the scientist presentation, here's science and you, one of those presentations, and that one covers the careers in science uh, that uh, we talked about uh, today. Bugs in your blood, malaria, that you have, healthy pet, healthy you. So we use veterinary medicine to stimulate kids' interest because they're interested in that. And this is how to get into vet school, my path to getting to the vet school, cat salad a bag. That's one of that's, uh, the guys I dean for our college right now. Scientists present, uh, this is interviews with scientists. Uh, what makes a genetics a person tick? How about neuroscience? You have those there. And these are interviews with uh, veterinary students. Why did they become inter interested in that? Why did you choose that? Why do you want to be large animal, small animal, whatever? And then this is one that's very good for, for the student. Because these are undergraduate students inspiring to go to med school. This student right here got accepted to every med school in Texas, also interviewed at Harvard, and she interviewed at the Mayo Clinic. Now she went to uh, Baylor uh, in Houston. Uh, she's, a, she's a physician now, but uh, in there she walked step by step of the interview process uh, that uh, students might want to do. Uh, and each one of those uh, talked about strategies because they all answered the same question. What strategy do you have for studying? What's your technique? Um, how, do you, how do you do it? And then also we have additional resources uh, like for the fetal pig dissection. So we have a, a little thing on fetal pig dissection that here. In addition to that, we have histology images that match it. Then most of the people look at gross images of these, but they don't have histology. Okay, you can hit that hyperlink right there uh, and go to the histology slide as if you had a microscope. So you don't need a fancy microscope. You don't need, uh, you can see the cell. You can see the different things that are here. So we have that for not only the fetal pig, but also for the other ones. I hope I can get back to where I was. Yeah, 
And so we have it not only for the feet of pig, uh, but all you need is a cell phone to be able to see it. We all talked about the day where you don't have computers for some of the students. You can see those images right there. And so uh, here's the histology resources that we have. So you have the whole body system. So you can access histology slides on every one of the body systems that you have. And I tried to put together for a course for the TEA uh, for high school for this, but I was unable to get that accomplished, uh, uh, Irene. So it maybe would be something that they would uh, be interested in now. But each one of those, so any body system you want, you have the PowerPoints uh, slides there. Uh, there's also uh, comes with a video. So I have on YouTube 14,000 subscribers, a million views of, of the, these are the uh, medical school basic type. This is a basic histology for the nerve, the muscle, connective tissue, whatever that matches the PowerPoint slides that they have that then you can hit on the hyperlink and go to the specific image that's there. So you don't need the images. You don't need a fancy microscope. You just need the cell phone or the computer access to the internet to be able to see that. Also, uh, scientist presentations is uh, one of the things that we've done in the past. Uh, I talked to 37,000 kids in five years. Um, and so, um, but nowadays we do this electronic. Keep it clean, getting ready for surgery. Smart bird, uh, examining plant and animal cells. These are things for the middle school. So you have to have a kind of funny uh, title uh, that, that you can see. So we do it electronically. And this was the videos that I was talking about earlier uh, that we were trying to get into the school. We, we, when we presented these, we had a lot of students that, that viewed these but then we start, had them videos and then the students, the teachers uh, stopped uh, requesting them to be able to see them. So we talk about different things, including travel. Where do you travel? There's uh, Japan right there. Hawaii has stayed there 10 whole days. It was tough, you can imagine. But this is where everybody wants to go. All scientists want to go there besides heaven. They want to go to Stockholm, Sweden where they get the Nobel prize. And right in the middle of that city hall is a big room. They get the Nobel Prize in that room, and just to the right, uh, which we can see the window of it right here, uh, there's a, a room laced in gold, and they go dance in the gold room. I've danced in the gold room. I didn't get a Nobel Prize, but you can believe I danced in that room. And so that's why I inspire students to do something like that. They have to have stamina. What is stamina? Stamina is when you finish your math test and got 10 minutes left over, you do it again. That's what it is. Uh, and so uh, scientists, we have teacher workshops that we've, we've done. And so we are lucky to have a grant right now to work with. We're on the third year of a five-year grant. Uh, and we have the teacher, uh, uh, we, the, the One Health curriculum that we have that has these different components in it. Uh, these are the things that we have, cell biology, stress, which is really endocrinology and our stress of the kids are in stress. We're stressed right now about our nation, right? and also infectious disease, ecology, clinical trials. These are different ones. And you can see those and, and any teacher wants to, they can use our LMS, our LMS. All they gotta do is register. And this is how we want to do it, gonna do it with the workshop. Uh, but we haven't had that much success at them doing it. Uh, also, another way you can view these uh, is by our viewer. So there's three ways to look at these materials. One is the viewer, and here you can see. Okay, so it has the essential knowledge and steel, uh, skills for each one of these things, a pretest. And this is a backpack adventures. This is another narrative story that sets it up that we can see. Meet the scientists, uh, take a note about this, practice as uh, quizzes, and then a real world science reviews, scientist videos, a teacher's uh, guide that we have. So we have that for each each one of these. Uh, and so you can get that through our LMS and use the LMS, get the information there, or you can uh, take that whole thing and put onto your LMS if you want to, uh, or, and it's all free, all this stuff is free. If you paid your taxes, you already paid for it. Um, and then you can do our viewer or the conventional website. And this is where you have the same thing that's on our conventional website that, 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 that we have. 
So basically, that's what we do. We develop curriculum. We have science and physics and uh, professional development, uh, which um, which we have, and um, and we have a synchronous, asynchronous uh, ones, uh, and we have uh, the asynchronous one. Uh, a teacher could take any time they want to, uh, uh, as as well. So basically, when all goes wrong, when things get wrong that that we can see my experiments don't work uh i uh, i always go on my lower drawer to pull out something i got from second graders this is a thank you note i went in there with a big bag full of lungs and i kept pulling them out yet a larger lung who do you think that is right there so this little girl drew these lungs right here with the tracheal rings around them and she says, thanks for coming. I have never in my life seen animal lungs. And this, is, this is a second grader. She hadn't had much of a life. I've been waiting for you to come ever since the teacher said you're going to come. I had the most fun with that oxygen thing. This is a second grader spelling, okay? And so this was a spirometer. Thanks. And I thank you guys for listening to our presentation. I hope we can collaborate with you. I learned a lot of uh, things today that I'm, I'm going to uh, follow up on. And thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you guys. Larry, someone asked in the chat if you have anything on animal prosthetics. That was the only main question that you didn't touch up on. So. Uh, no, we, we don't have anything on that. Sorry about that. Well, there's still time to develop it, Larry. Yes, so. you do have things on orthopedics. Thank you. That was an awesome presentation. We really appreciate it. And folks, this brings us right to our scheduled endpoint of the meeting. So the breakouts we were going to have were just to allow you to share a takeaway from, from the meeting, something about the text or the tools or the resources. And so we're going to forego that and ask you just to put something about that in your evaluation. Um, Kiki has shared with everyone in the chat, um, the Google Docs file that has uh, many of our presentations. She just put it up again. Well, this is, well the, um, this is the, the, the evaluation form. And you guys, you just have to forgive me for being so minimally Google literate. So this is just a Word document and we're asking you to take that onto your computer, tell us what you liked and what you, what you would change and then like email it, old fashioned email to Irene uh, with, with uh, I think we tell you what to put in the subject line so she can collect those and send out the certificates and then we'll also Irene and I will sit down afterwards and and go through and 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 think about how we can do this better so um yeah don't fill it out on there because it's not a google form it is literally a word document chunked in that folder okay <laughs> and that's probably because of me because no, we were all I don't talking know how to about questions <laughs> before, and I'm a baby boomer. So, um, thank you all, Kiki, Linda. You've been awesome. The sharing has been terrific. We are going to make sure that we incorporate virtual sessions in the future as well as. Um, face-to-face. Uh, -face. I just think this has been a rich, rich day. Um, Linda, do you have anything further to share? I, I really appreciate the work that everybody has done, especially you, Irene, and Kiki, and this whole group. I look forward to this meeting every year. I've done it several years, and I love kicking off the year this way. It gives me hope to see so many people serving and working so hard to improve our education on the environment. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for letting me be part of it. Thank you. Um, I, and I, I wanted to say something else. I've been looking at all of the um, resources in the chat and I've been copying them onto a document, oh, which I will awesome. condense to like just links and, and titles and that kind of stuff and send it to you guys. So if y'all wanna hang around for a few more moments and if you have announcements, events, websites that you want to share 
do that now and I'll send that out with a, in a follow-up email to y'all. So, um, and, and I've been collecting them throughout. So, so I'm hoping to get all of that together like in a nice way uh, because we did sort of schedule an optional social time. We're not at Schultz's. I am so sad. <laughs> so we can hang out as long as you would like until make me four or something. But like the formal part of this is, is uh, um, we're done with that. Thank you all. Our formal meeting is adjourned. We'll see you again. You are all welcome to stay and visit. It was great visiting during breaks and lunch. And if you have more vis visiting energy, hang, hang in there and we'll do it. Um, and we'll see you again. Thank you for your contribution, your um, stick to staying here right till the end. It was fabulous, really mm -hmm. great.